saw that global economy has suffered many slows in the last few years, and we are seeing world changing a lot. We have just pulled out of COVID, uh, which for more than a year almost stopped the world economy, and as a consequence of all the subsidies and money issues, we are today uh, worldwide facing quite substantial inflation and problems uh, around inflation. Um, But there are more, uh, more than just inflation that is a consequence of COVID. The world has changed already after COVID. COVID. Today, we are also facing more and more severe climate disruptions, floodings, hurricanes, landslides, raising water levels, severe droughts. Uh, beside loss of lives and property, we also see disruption in supply chain, which is affecting companies worldwide. Um, and yet, Despite all these problems I've mentioned, we are unable to reach agreement on decarbonization and UN climate goals because some things we know will have to change and that, that hurts. Geopolitical consequences of wars. Just yesterday, Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell warns uh, of growing geopolitical risks to the global financial system. Middle East conflict and war in Ukraine threaten to have spillover effects to markets reducing economic activity and boosting inflation worldwide. Fourth disruption that might be really positive effect is AI revolution. Um, and we will try to address uh, all of the four topics uh, in this panel. Now I would like to start with our panelists. I would uh, first like to um, ask Mr. You must argue then. Hello. Um, you said that you would like to talk about the change uh, in attitude and priorities needed for a sustainable future and the role of good governance and sustainability. Just for the start, introduce yourself and give us some issues that you start with. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yilmaz Argudan. Uh, I'm a management consultant, uh, investment banker, and uh, according to Wikipedia, strategist and governance expert and author. Uh, I run a management consulting firm uh, is based in Istanbul, but we are very much involved with global issues. I'm also the chairman of Rothschild uh, Strategy Office, uh, and I serve on the boards of uh, many different companies. And uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you all to this wonderful land of Turkey, Republic of Turkey, uh, which is the meeting point of continents, cultures, history, and has a lot of diversity. So, particularly, we have a lot of lessons about how to live together of different cultures and sustainability and living together culture have a lot to do uh, with each other. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, when the time comes. Should I stop the introduction or continue? Up to you. Okay. Okay. First of all, let me start uh, welcoming you all. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. Pax Wobiskun, Shalom Alaya. All of them mean peace be with you. So the basically the spirit of all religions is about peace. And the basis of sustainability is peace as well. I hope peace will be upon all of us. As a matter of fact, one of the most important scientists, Albert Einstein, said. Peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. We know that he had a deep understanding of the spirit of science as well. From the fact that many of his postulates are just being getting proved. Apparently, he had a lot of uh, understanding of the spirit of human beings as well with the sentence. So, uh, Basically, uh, people form institutions, whatever those institutions are, from family to company to governments, for two basic reasons. One of them is to, for better utilization of resources. The 
the second is to manage the risks. And the only way those institutions can achieve those goals is if they have trust of their stakeholders. And building trust is the key for a sustainable future. Because trust is the essence of good governance and foundation of sustainable future. So I, I, in the remaining parts of the uh, discussion, I would like to talk why governance is, good governance is extremely important for sustainability and what kind of mind shifts we need in order to really understand the spirit of the importance of trust for a better future for all of us. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, and uh, fear. When the war started, everybody was feared that what was the future, uh, what was Ukraine going to be like. Uh, I went to Ukraine when the war started as a volunteer. Uh, we helped with uh, humanitarians, we helped with some of the ministries. And uh, Ukraine is also one of the largest exporters for agricultural business. And we are working on some projects in agriculture. Uh, now, I don't know how many of you have recently been to Ukraine now. I would put it this way, if you go to Kiev, uh, it is business like usual, uh, besides the location of airways, the land that we will here, uh, the locals like to joke about that, like now it's probably not the safest city in Europe because of all these problems they have received. Now, in terms of what I am doing and what uh, our company is doing, is we would like to help Ukrainians to bring in foreign investments. Uh, specifically focused on SMEs, and we will also work on helping the Ukrainian SMEs to export their products and services to global markets. Uh, and we work in various sectors, so agriculture is one of the sectors that we are looking at, uh, energy, uh, materials, uh, and one of the most uh, uh, interesting projects that we've uh, encountered recently is on waste management. Uh, how do we process all this? Uh, constructions and industrial waste as a result of the uh, aggression by the uh, uh, Russian invasion uh, is going to be a challenge for uh, not just the current but also for the future of the Ukrainian people. Now I'll come back to that at a later stage, but the uh, takeaway from now is that uh, if you have not looked at the Ukrainian markets, it is worth looking at it. Uh, should you go into the Ukraine now? Probably not for everyone. Uh, and then again, I'll come back to why is that the case. And uh, I'll leave it at that at this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yipe. Um Now I'd like to move to my left. Um, uh, we have a, a lawyer who is specialized in uh, anti corruption laws and fighting corruption. Um, Michael Nike is partner at uh, Hubbard and Reed from the United States. Um, please, maybe a few words for, for, for, your, for your side. And um, just, just a, a starting point. Uh, we all know that um, corruption is a worldwide problem and that it, there is a reason that many companies who have to fo uh, follow the anti-corruption laws don't invest in countries uh, which very rarely need investments. So, please, a few issues points from here. Sure, thank you very much. And I am an American lawyer in Paris. They, they haven't started the Netflix series about me yet, but um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's a very important topic. Uh, for me, the, the points I wanted to speak about today are <clears throat> that when there's a crisis, when there's a war, it's actually an opportunity to change what is business as usual. And I think in Ukraine, and also in America, in many cases, business as usual is, is corrupt, or at least it's not transparent. It's not necessarily in the interest of the people it's supposed to help. And so some of the experiences I'll share are trainings that we've done for Ukrainian government officials to try to change their mindset, and importantly, try to explain why that's important. Um, so corruption is a strategic weapon, a strategic weapon that's being used uh, to undermine Ukrainian civil society and, and governments in the West as well. And so you really do choose who your friends will be uh, based on your conduct. Um, rebuilding, wars, all of these things are crises. And there's a very understandable desire and, and impulse to do what's easy to address the situation. And there are many crisis moments, but using these as an opportunity to do what's right and do things in the right way. Uh, and yes, it is a, a moral judgment and, a, and it's something from perspective. Uh, it, it is an important opportunity. You know, rebuilding in a way to make sure things are safer, cleaner, better afterwards is really what's in the interest of the people being served. Thank you very much for this uh, starting point. Um, we are moving to our last panelist, uh, Urs 
Urs Unkar, sorry for that. Um, Urs, would you please shortly introduce yourself and what you would like to talk about? Yeah, good morning to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to the organizers of Ferraris uh, and to uh, Dr. Frank Richter who invited me here and uh, glad that so many people made it to this important session this morning. So, um, I'm the CEO of a business uh, diplomacy think tank called uh, the Federal Association for Economic Development of Foreign Trade, BWA Global Economic Network, a Berlin based uh, think tank and business association which is working since 20 years. We are building bridges to good business with more than uh, so far 100 countries. Um, my academic background is in history and sociology. I was also a foreign policy advisor at the German Parliament and uh, a visiting lecturer at uh, Ala University, the uh, Diplomatic Academy of Azerbaijan. So when we look in nowadays world, we are facing multiple challenges in doing global business, which uh, sometimes are entangled with each other, uh, overlapping each other, and um, are strengthening each other. So we still have, and to a certain extent, consequences of the global COVID uh, pandemic, um, mainly in sectors such as tourism, there was a uh, recently World Tourism uh, Conference held in uh, Samarkand in Uzbekistan, and the industry is just about to get to the pre COVID level back. Um, then we have, of course, uh, such issues like we already touched upon rising conflicts, uh, namely the war in Ukraine, um, the uh, attack of the Hamas uh, in Israel, and the uh, resulting conflict uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And, um, and many, many other issues uh, about which we forget. We have uh, instable countries uh, in Africa, um, namely uh, Sudan, uh, Somalia. Um, we just uh, recently through coup uh, in Western African countries, Gabon uh, and uh, Niger. So um, my point I would like to make here in the first round is uh, that in times of uncertainty, uh, we need strong networks. We need uh, to focus on what is going on in the countries and in the regions, businesses rather have a regional perception of just looking at uh, like countries. And um, therefore, we need uh, serious estimations, we need more uh, background knowledge, we need business intelligence, um, those are things we're working on. And we also need to see how interconnected the world still is. So, uh, last year, as one of the consequences of uh, the war that started by Russia and Ukraine, was to discuss about. Uh, Decoupling, de risking, you know, it's rather de risking than decoupling because I will see globalization is going on. But um, nevertheless, we are living in a multipolar, totally centric world. So the third decade of the 21st century is not going to be dominated by one hegemonic power. The last century, somehow, we had in the, uh, in the second half, we had a bipolar world which was overcome and then the war. Then we had uh, what was perceived as a unilateral moment uh, with the predominance uh, of the Western bloc under the leadership of the United States. And now um, we have the rise of Asia, we have the uh, rise of China, now the rise of India and uh, the ASEAN states. Uh, but uh, it's not going to be a purely Asian uh, century, and it's also not it's going to be a Western century anymore, it's a totally centric world. So um, we have the rise of the middle powers. Um, we should uh, keep more attention on what is going on in countries like now, especially Egypt, but also Mexico, Nigeria, Indonesia, Bangladesh. I could not say more, but uh, just to make clear what I understand of the term middle powers, we have uh, structures emerging out of these disruptions like the BRICS, but also the CICA, the conference on cost buildings matters in Asia, um, organizations like uh, the Organization of Islamic States, uh, LGS Organization of Turkic States, uh, I need to mention that especially here in Turkey, which is now evolving as, a, uh, as an actor in global politics with uh, emerging importance. So to sum up my first point, uh, the world is in disruption, but there are new um, structures uh, building on themselves, and uh, there are new um, ways, new forms of regional cooperation so we will not have a separated world, but rather a world which looks um, or which is um, subdivided into different regional blocks, which are, and that is uh, truth which we still have to acknowledge in Europe and especially in Germany, which have Britain by national interests and uh, 
interests are back in politics, power is back to politics, and uh, perhaps we were dreaming a bit uh, too much in the recent years about a world which is going to be unified and all the problems are going to be solved. Now problems are emerging, but uh, new constellations also bring new potentials for developing the solutions. So uh, I think for an introductory statement, uh, that's the point uh, I can make here. Thank you for this good starting point. Um, uh, what this uh, panel uh, is focusing on is how to find solutions to um, global economic problems. So uh, I kindly invite also the audience to raise your hands and if you would like to add something or if you have some comment, feel free to, to do so. Uh, so we have like Four, four topics uh, that uh, we want to talk about. So COVID and what happened after COVID and the consequences of COVID, how, how can we uh, make uh, find solutions to that climate change? Uh, then what is the what are the effects of war and, and how can how can we live in, in that world and how can we somehow manage manage the, the consequences and uh, the fourth one which is uh, AI for the better world. Uh, we haven't uh, touched that one yet, I would maybe just uh, give a few issuing points. So, um, recently BCG made um, a paper on the impact of AI on productivity and quality uh, of uh, their workers. So, they would divide uh, um, workers who, who are at BCG into two groups, one that are using AI and the ones that are not. And um, AI equipped consultants finish 12.2% uh, more tasks on average, 25.1% faster, and 40% higher quality compared to those without AI support. So um, we could ask ourselves, can okay, AI be used in global north and global south to reduce social inequality and accelerate progress to UN climate goals? Maybe Start on my right. What are your views on that? Should I start with sustainability or AI? Let me start with sustainability first. Sure, of course. Next up. Uh, what is sustainability? Actually, sustainability is about protecting the humanity from the excess of human beings. In that, we need to consider not only our own interests, but the interests of all of our stakeholders, including the future generations, as well as other living species. In order to do this properly, we need to have a mind shift on how we look at the world. First of all, we need to start with our language because words determine how you think about things and your thoughts determine how you act about things. What, let me start with this one. Right now, we are, most people, particularly in the investment area and so forth, are talking about ESG investment, ESG and so forth. I think this uh, ESG abbreviation is not doing justice to the way we should be thinking about sustainability. For a number of different reasons. First of all, when you say ESG reporting, it means that the real thing is financial reporting, this is adjunct. So whenever there's pressure, forget about this, go for the financial. Whereas we need to think about it in an integrated fashion. Second, when we say ESG, ENS, environmental and social, are impact areas. And governance is not an impact area, that's how to do it. So it looks like apple, pear, and a ball. You can't eat the third one. So rather than ESG, I suggest G's, governance in parentheses of economic, environmental, and social, close parentheses. Because governance needs to be applied to all the impacts in different areas, economic, environmental, and social. And economic is different than financial in that it is about value creation throughout the value chain. 
financial is, what is due to a particular company. The, as long as we focus on only financial, and that becomes the prominent way we think about things, our decisions are not going to be sustainable. So the way we should be thinking about is governance of economic, environmental, and social impacts together. This means that we need to, first of all, expand our horizon and dimensions from only financial to economic, environmental, and social impacts in all of our decisions. Also, we need to think about not only the short-term quarterly reporting, but rather the long-term broaden our perspectives. As a matter of fact, one of the most important basic tenets of all the religious systems, everybody's belief is their own, but I'm a Muslim. In our religion, we have the uh, hell and heaven. But in uh, Hinduism, there is the reincarnation. What are these doing? It is expanding our thought process to beyond our life, basically. Trying to expand our life the way we think about things. All of them have, all the religions have uh, social justice in it. Because if you don't have social justice, then you fight and you dissipate energy. You don't build trust. So the way we should be thinking in our decision making is we need to think about not only financial outcomes, but also the outcomes in all these other areas. And not only about ourselves, but also about all the stakeholders. So we need to expand our uh, decision uh, and uh, thought process to incorporate others as well. And uh, this also means that we need to expand the way we understand responsibility. The future of the CEOs or the decision makers in all uh, types of institutions, also including the states, is that should not be constrained with what they can control easily, which is their own company. They should be able to influence the environment, and when I'm so talking about the environment, it's not the, only the climate, but also the social environment, the trust environment, uh, oh, and the uh, environment, environment, all of them. Uh, and try to influence that as well. So our responsibility includes not only our own institutions, but also with what we can do with our own institutions, with our power, to make the world a better place. Which means that we need to focus more on collective action. We need to work together. If there is something not going right in one place of the world, it is our responsibility to help it, help solve that as well. Because if we don't do that, it is like a cancer in this uh, cell, it's going to grow. We need to take care of that. As well. So I mean that we need to expand our horizons in terms of dimension, in terms of the different types of stakeholders that our decisions are influencing, in terms of time frame, and in terms of the responsibility area that we are thinking about. So it's not only what we can control, but also what we can influence. Only then we will have a sustainable future. And for this, in order to accomplish this, I suggest that, first of all, we, think we start uh, incorporating integrated thinking and integrated reporting, because it is a move in this direction that I'm talking about. We need to think about long-term impacts of our decisions on all different dimensions. We need to do more impact analysis, which means that we need to consider double material. Not only what's material to us, but also what's material to others. Because what's material to others, in the long term, will become material to us. Assume responsibility for collective action to improve the world. And in short, as I mentioned, this land had lots of enlightened people. One of them, Yunus Ember from the 13th century, said that, regard the other as you regard yourself. That's the meaning of four holy books, if there is any. And that's the uh, type of understanding we need to take for a sustainable future. We need to regard the others as we regard ourselves. And we need to consider the impacts of all of our decisions to all the different stakeholders and uh, act accordingly if we are going to have a sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you.
there are climate uh, problems and uh, we need to solve them. But if you look at those climate uh, goals and, and countries that are saying that they will apply to them, you see that the biggest countries like US and China uh, will not sign the climate agreements. The reason is that they are fearing that their this will be impairing their economy. So I will come to you first to talk from the contract economy. How do you, we have, I think now we all have this ESG reporting and many of uh, people are saying that ESG reporting is many times just greenwashing, that companies are reporting uh, what they are doing on, on the climate and ESG targets, but in, in, in fact, but in fact uh, it's just to show that, that not enough is being done really uh, to, to um, Decrease the decarbonization to have the decarbonization. So, um, can you talk a little bit about how you perceive ESG uh, reporting and uh, is, is, is, is the climate change uh, in terms of companies really just the cost or, or are the companies aware of the fact that we, we want to survive and drive in this world, we will need to do that? Uh, yes. yes. I mean, when we say carbon emissions, of course, the agricultural industry is one of the biggest industries uh, which is using water and also animal livestock, their productions and their carbon emissions is one of the biggest challenge in agriculture. And also agriculture can destroy itself it's the resources not used in a proper manner. Here we have a triple challenge, we say, Mariana. And we just summarize the triple challenge as peace at home, peace in the world, and peace for food. When we say peace at home, the livelihoods of farmers are critical importance because they are working in a very uncertain environment, which we call climate crisis. And when we look at the ESG, what about the social impact of farmers? Is there a social justice for farmers? Or in uh, another angle perspective, uh, in uncertain environment, how people ensure their outputs? If they, if because of climate crisis, if the output goes down, how we will finance them? Think of farmers in this environment, they will continue to farm or not? These are the, let's say, the question marks. That's why peace at home uh, for farmers is uh, very important. And uh, also they have to use technologies uh, to handle the climate crisis. And uh, when you look at the average age of farmers in developed countries, it's about 60, 60 years old. And when we look at the developing countries, in fact, uh, it's the farmer's average age is about 50. And think of these colleagues and how they will use AI or technologies for agriculture is a big challenge. That's why how we attract the young people to agricultural industry, I think, is a, is a big challenge. And this young generation in, uh, in a agricultural industry will be able to use these technologies. Uh, that's why we should improve and develop the livelihoods of farms. And we call this peace at home. When we come to peace in the world, international trade is the key for agriculture. Otherwise, uh, it will not go on. But what we see, because of wars, the international trade is getting less and less. And moreover, because of price, food price inflation, national prote protectionism is increasing. And that's also a big barrier for international trade. What does it mean? As a globe, we have a soil and water. And we should use these resources in a proper and productive manner worldwide. And this is only possible with international trade. Because you cannot produce soybeans in Turkey. You can produce soybeans in Brazil. Or when we come to palm, 
You can produce the palm in Malaysia, Indonesia, in different climates. You cannot produce it in Turkey. That's why we need peace in the world and to increase the international trade to tackle the price of inflation. And last but not least, the peace for food. And uh, agricultural production can destroy its, uh, let's say, production itself. If you do not use the water in a good manner, that may degrade the soil. And how to tackle this? We need more technologies here. And the drone technologies, precision farming, learning irrigation systems, uh, and we should, let's say, optimize or we should minimize the negative externalities of agriculture. Otherwise, we can lose uh, our production and animal livestock. And also when you look at, uh, let's say, carbon footprints, uh, for example, as a social and environmental effect, the ruminants, the dairy production, the carbon emission of the dairy uh, can destroy the soil and water. And how to tackle this with new technologies, biogas technologies, and how to tackle the output of the, not only the milk, but also the manure, how to manage the manure, and which technologies should be used is also critical uh, for the agriculture. And we should not forget this, developing countries has huge potential. Why? Because when you look at their social demographics, young population uh, can handle the agriculture, and if developed countries transfer the technologies to developing countries, I am sure uh, when you look at the populated globe and where the population is increasing in developing countries, there is a huge potential there. And integrated reporting and uh, sustainability, it's also uh, much more, let's say, promoted by the young people. So we have a huge potential here uh, for developing countries to tackle the price food inflation. And what will be the conclusion on that? we will see less immigration to develop countries. And the people stay in their homelands. And uh, I just would like to finalize by repeating the triple challenge. Peace at home, peace in the world, and peace for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a really powerful word. And I Peace, then all the other problems in the economy can be solved. So I guess that that should be the first priority. Uh, and as we said before, peace uh, can only be achieved in uh, if the sides listen to each other and, and look for solutions. It cannot be triggered by by by force. So I would like to come to you and maybe this that would be a starting point for you. Uh, uh, so we are, we, are talk, we are trying to cover the topic of climate change that we all the time also, uh, even the world is independent, so interdependent, so we, everything is connected. How, how do you see the uh, prospects of peace and how can, how, when do you see the investment, uh, especially in the environmental part, will be this kind So, so yes. Uh, First of all, I think if you were to uh, talk to anyone these days, everyone is fearful about what is going to happen, what is the future. Um, you just keep loud and Yes, okay. Um, in the last year or so, we've had conversations on the ground in Ukraine about how the conflict between Ukraine and Russia can spread to the uh, broader world and world economy. Uh, and we're not just talking about food inflation, we're not just talking about economic consequences, but also political consequences. Because if you look at the two wars uh, in the past, the regional conflict proceeds before the world war. And now we are increasingly seeing a conflict in the world where uh, conflicts are now being seen in the Middle East, in Africa. Now the only difference that we believe is going to be 
uh, uh, hopeful is that we are in uh, ever more interconnected world today than we have ever been before. Uh, with you know, the internet, with international travel, with the fact that today we are all able to come here to the Zante and talk about international cooperation, brings us hope that through uh, uh, international trade, uh, we can uh, minimize that conflict. Now, um, to do that, we have a long-term plan. We have we need to start talking about uh, making plans for the long term, not just uh, on the quarterly financial report, as uh, you had mentioned. Uh, and we also need to focus on peace, where we need to start thinking about how uh, our actions, corporate actions, can affect uh, social behaviors. So corporate social responsibility has been talked about for years, but with the conflicts that are now happening around the world, it's ever more important that we need to look at how can we bring peace uh, from uh, a business point of view. And um, by doing so, uh, by having a interconnected uh, trade, by, by, by having more trade, in theory we should also reduce inflation. The fact that AI is now taking place, uh, technology in general, is a Is that okay now? Yes, okay. That's okay, yes. Um, so, um, it's interesting that 12 months ago, nobody is talking about AI, and now everybody is talking about how AI is going to improve uh, productivity, uh, improve business operations. Um, and AI, by nature, should be deflation. So, we have a powerful force that can help us to bring down uh, inflation. And um, coming to the uh, sustainable um, investment, um, I think for any companies, especially SMEs that we focus on, is to have to start having some ideas about uh, what is it that your company would like to achieve in, say, a five-year horizon, in a ten-year horizon. Now I know it's difficult to do that in the current environments. But it's ever more important now to be able to have that contingency plans, to have that risk assessment, especially right now with the situations. Like we spoke to a lot of Ukrainian companies, a lot of them are looking at what is it that they need to do uh, post war, uh, despite the fact that nobody knows when the war will end in Ukraine. Uh, and everybody is talking about we need to increase more trade with Europe. We need to increase trade with the rest of the world. Uh, we need to be having that dialogue. We need to keep that dialogue open. Uh, and for any companies that are looking at the situations right now, I think um, you need to be able to know, for example, if you are considering going to Ukraine in that sense, uh, because maybe you want to uh, explore the uh, markets in Ukraine, or you would like to use Ukraine as your base uh, to export your products or services. Uh, you need to know exactly what is it that you all like to achieve by having a presence uh, in the Ukrainian market. Uh, and I think one lesson that we can also learn from business communities in Ukraine is that um, more it is ever more important, again, I cannot emphasize this enough, is to keep that dialogue, keep that communication open with your international partners. Uh, we know that we talked a lot about uh, regional security when it comes to natural resources, when it comes to technology, but um, trade barriers uh, or um, technology impediment would uh, actually create uh, a negative impact when it comes to peace, when it comes to sustainable investment. So, um, my biggest takeaway, I think, I hope uh, everyone here is to have that conversation going, whether it is in your ballroom, whether it is in your uh, operations, is to think about what is that you, uh, your business can, uh, can, uh, can help. And also, uh, because of the fact that I'm now working in Ukraine, I would also like you to think about uh, maybe there's something that you would like to explore when it comes to business opportunities. 
uh, in Ukraine because at the end of the day that we are uh, in a way well neighbors here. So uh, I think it's our responsibilities to help our neighbors as well. So uh, and that's how we leave it uh, to the moderator. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael, uh, you've been involved in, uh, in and talking with investors and, and you know their perspectives on when and how they can start investing in Ukraine. Uh, we all know that uh, money is a shy word, so um, probably investors are waiting for the war to end uh, and then they will start to invest or do you have any other views and how do you think that US can uh, because U.S. has a great influence in when the wars will stop or when we will reach some, some peace. Uh, how can you comment on, on this topic? Sure, thanks. I, it's, it's maybe a bit flattering to say that the US, U.S. has influenced. There may be things that happen in the U.S. that are crazy that influence what happens uh, at the end of the day there. But um, one thing that we've frankly struggled with and are, are working towards a solution on is that um, there's a lot of coverage in the media about corruption in, in Ukraine, yeah, or even just say you know, corruption is a big word, you know, misuse of funds, whether those are for armaments, whether those are for rebuilding. And when you talk to people in Ukraine about meta principles like peace, corruption, everyone agrees, right? It's not like there's people there who engage in bribery and they call their parents and are proud about it and you know say look how great a job I did at either accepting or receiving a bribe. So we've struggled to try to find in practice in practical terms what can you actually do that's sustainable to increase the amount of effect and impact that money could have if and when it comes in to invest. And that's required really meeting with people at the local level, meeting with them talking with them and understanding what their lives are like and what pressures they are under. And so you, know, you do need the right you know, culture and tone from the top about you know, having a view that you say corruption is bad or that certain uh, countries are trying to harm Ukraine and that they, people need to be aware of that. But then you need to actually, you can't just walk away and consider the job done. You have to then talk to the people on the ground and explain to them, okay, well, look, if you want to get investment from European governments, European banks, U.S. government-backed uh, funds, U.S. banks, there's going to be expectations about governance uh, and how you use the funds, and that we can help you understand that. What we've also found is that trying to actually explain the law puts people to sleep. Uh, and isn't that really useful to people in their practical lives? So we try to show them examples of the impact of corruption. And if you're talking about development funds, for example, you can show people, well, look, there's supposed to be a school here, and there's not a school. Or there's supposed to be a road, and it's just not there. And where did the money go? Um, with Ukraine, we have some very violent and immediate examples of what happens with corruption. Um, a few examples that the Ukrainian audience enjoys are the sinking of the Russian missile cruiser, the Moskva. There are reports out of Russian media that one of the reasons the ship wasn't able to defend itself was because during uh, repairs that were supposed to upgrade its missile systems, the captain of the ship fixed one missile tube and pocketed the rest of the money. Uh, obviously a great impact to the lives of the sailors on the ship uh, and to the, that country's standing. And so using examples like that is much more impactful in Ukraine and dealing with Ukrainians. Now, talking about rebuilding a city here is not nearly as dramatic as that, um, but there, there can be benefits to really engaging with people who are actually involved in rebuilding efforts uh, here uh, and really in any country. What challenges do you face? What's hard for you to implement as far as these big picture items uh, and really engaging with them in a dialogue about the sustainable ways and tools and practices and processes that they can implement to do that? We have one question there. 
do you mind if we just uh, finish this first round and then we will you get the call? So Urs, you're, you're, let's say that you're representative of Europe uh, in this panel. Uh, how do you see um, the Europe, um, how it is impacting the world at the moment? Uh, we, we can see that Europe has a, a lessening uh, effect in our uh, not so much world uh, as it used to have. Uh, how do you think that Europe can help in uh, solving the climate problems and, and also the peace in the world? Very good question, and I can give a clear answer on that. Um, so Europe is currently uh, making much less impact than it could. Um, there are several reasons for that. There are currently um, different uh, problems affecting the uh, state of the European Union. We have uh, ongoing mass migration, now expecting more uh, through the Middle East conflict. Um, Europe, and especially Germany, uh, is facing an economic crisis. Uh, Germany is the only country in the OECD group facing decrease this year. Even Russia, which is now one of the most sanctioned international economies <coughs> worldwide, is uh, facing plus 1.5, 1.6% growth according to expectations of the OECD. Um, and in addition to that, thank you, that works better. In addition to that, we have um, different uh, problems in internal coordination, so um, we are facing a, a lack of structural reforms within the uh, EU decision-making process. We have no coherent uh, common foreign policy, and um, Europe is also not taken uh, serious as a mediator, as an actor in a few parts of the world. Let me give one concrete example. Um, we have talked already about conflicts, and there's been one conflict which is now more or less resolved. Um, and the first one in the post-Soviet space, namely the conflict between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. Azerbaijan has uh, restored its territorial integrity by the uh, anti-terror measures undertaken uh, in September. And uh, of course there can be aspects uh, which are worth discussing, but uh, this process was achieved as uh, restoration of territorial integrity, fully complying with all um, international regulations of humanitarian law. This was achieved without a, a significant contribution of the European Union. There have been negotiations going on, uh, supported uh, by the United States, um, by Russia and by Turkey strongly. Um, the EU has tried to play an intermediary role there, but uh, practically failed. And uh, this will make an impact not only in Azerbaijan, but uh, in uh, the greater Silk Road region, Caspian region, however you call it, part of the world between eastern borders of Europe and the western borders of East Asia. So um, Europe is giving an understatement currently. Also we have, uh, from my personal perspective, uh, we have a lack of leadership at the top level. Um, we have a lack of uh, seriousness in the way how we assess uh, other parts of the world. Um, because as I already said in my first statement, the world is going to be a polar-centric world and uh, the European Union is not going to be the development model or the unique development model for the rest of the world. So when we talk with the countries of uh, Latin America, Asia, Africa, uh, we should be aware of this. Um, if the EU in general and Germany in particular uh, would be taken serious in the future. So there are certain issues and which need to be overcome and uh, we also have to name clearly what is our interest and based on that we should set up negotiations also taking the interest in the perspective uh, of the respective counterpart. Unfortunately there are not so many efforts going to that direction currently. Well, next year we have uh, elections of the Parliament of the European Union. Some changes are expected or are likely to happen and uh, we'll see if there's a new impact and a new uh, stimulation of potentials after the EU parliamentary elections. Um, nevertheless, Europe um, is due to its uh, economic uh, strengths, due to its um, role in international politics. Uh, with France, uh, we have a EU, uh, UN uh, Security Council member still. Um, UK is doing a bit, uh, following its own priorities, but still having uh, 
coordination somehow with the EU foreign policy. Um, Germany is trying to face or to overcome uh, various domestic challenges on which we would have a totally no panel. But um, as I said, uh, there is a lack of leadership and uh, the way to overcome that is uh, we need more seriousness in uh, the way how to access uh, other parts of the world. Thank you. Now we have a gentleman uh, who is raising his hand for some time, so please give him the microphone. And we have one more here, and one more here. Three, four, start up there. Uh, thank you, Roger. Um, from his I'll I'm coming over from Singapore. Um, uh, forgive me, I can't uh, quote all of the different um, panelists who've raised points, but just to paraphrase, I'll begin with Mr. Ugly, and he talks about sustainability being about saving uh, the planet from ourselves, essentially. And we've heard repeatedly reference to a lack of leadership. Um, I have two questions within that. One is, rather than focusing on artificial intelligence as a methodology of moving forwards, um, what does the panel think about focusing on emotional intelligence? And just to uh, try and cap, uh, paraphrase what I mean by that, this panel is representative of a deficit we face in society in that roughly 17% of the panel is female, 50.9% of the world's population is female, and yet I'd say 93% of the room are male. So what do we think about integrating more female emotional leadership into our processes and emotional intelligence rather than just artificial intelligence going forward to uh, rest, wrestle with that deficit of leadership? And the other point I wanted to raise is that um, having been to war zones as a military officer in my past and seen the worst that humanity can do to itself, um, wars are often the result of a great inequality. And the greatest inequality comes through taxation. What does the panel think about the fact that when we talked about the US has a leadership position, yet many US corporations, British corporations, European corporations don't pay their fair share of tax? And that has a net result that it trickles down to the developing economies where people feel like they are in an unequal situation. So if you can extract from that my two questions, perhaps anyone can take it on. But how do we integrate more female leadership and how do we get companies to pay their fair share of tax on a global basis so that we reduce inequality? Thank you very much. These were two really great questions. So who is going to go for the first one? Thank you for Thank you for uh, good questions. First of all, I think uh, in the leadership and decision-making uh, authority, we need diversity of many different dimensions. Definitely gender diversity, but also age diversity, but also geographic diversity, diversity of experience. That is extremely important. By the way, I'm working quite highly on getting gender diversity at the boards. We have programs, education programs, mentorships, and so forth that we have developed. So I'm a true believer of that. But uh, I think the diversity, we should not think only about gender diversity. If, for example, uh, I don't know whether if it is the case right now, but about 20, 15 years ago, uh, when I was the chair of the Turkish US Business Council, more than a third of the US Congress did not even have a passport. And they made decisions about the world. In terms of taxation, I think our current taxation system definitely needs a major overhaul. Not with respect to only how much from whom, which is very important, those are the questions that you mentioned, but about how we should tax people. Because our current tax systems are focusing on what we can measure easily and how we can collect more easily. Whereas, we need to tax negative externalities, not positive externalities. For example, value added is very important, we tax it. Youth unemployment is a serious problem, uh, but we, incur, we don't encourage, we tax employment. Okay. Carbon is 
a major problem, we don't tax it. We give incentives for the other ones. So we need to align the incentives with the world we want. My suggestion is that keep the total taxation the same, tax the negative externalities instead of positive externalities. World will become a much better place much faster. Thank you. Absolutely agree, not just corporations, but also in rich individuals are not being affected taxes as, as the rest of the population. Uh, who is going to tackle the second one or are we going to have another? We, we still have seven minutes left, so please uh, be short and so that we can. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Profound, useful, and valid congratulations to all of you. I'll make a quick comment and then I'll ask very two quick questions. I presume reconstructing the economy must focus the efforts on the bottom of the pyramid. All these was the accentuation of economics, the economic concentration, the rich becoming richer and the poor becoming poorer, perhaps is one of the concerns, one of the issues that we face. We've seen in India, I come from India, we've seen in India that using digitalization has assisted the financial inclusion of the bottom of the poor, the entire poor country. 515 million people in India in 2014 and 15 were financially included, and today they are the pioneers of e-commerce. So if the efforts of the world and if the investments of the world are geared towards financial inclusion of the poor, the person will be like in China. Will that help the emerging economies or not? And should I put the focus there or anywhere else? Second, my second comment on that person. Worldwide, we've experienced different festivals, festivals, Chinese New Year, Eid, whatever, we get gifts. Is it time to think, rethink our gifts? Is it time not to suggest, let's buy the gifts which are made by the poor and the poor, let's buy the gifts which are made by the war refugees of Ukraine or of Palestine. Let's buy the gifts that promote the cottage industry, the press buy the gifts which are promoted by the farmers of the world. Will that help the world economy better and more stronger and make it system? Thank you. Thank you. Is anybody commenting on the, on the first question, which is on um, AI and this, uh, can technology improve the, the, the poor, the status of the poor? So, certainly yes. For sure, and it's you know you look at mobile phones being something that allowed people in many continents to leapfrog uh, the absence of landline technology. I think AI, at least as I've seen it used uh, in some startup settings in the U.S., is something that allows people who don't have access to networks you might get from fancy schools or seed money from parents or banks to really do a lot of the bed work coding, initial work, and things like that, you would need to do to start a company in a matter of minutes. Uh, and the, now there's some big companies, going back to the tax question of companies, who can make that those systems scalable for a lot of people. So it's, you know, there's always, always trade-offs. But, um, so on that point, I think certainly yes. So, and I don't see any, any downside with, you know, supporting, uh, uh, countries and populations in need by trying to reprioritize our gift purchasing uh, to them as well. Thank you. Please try to be short. I have one more question. For now, Dr. Arvidan said um, good governance is the good governance is a prerequisite for sustainability and the essence of good governance is trust. Now, we need, and we also said that the top, top level, maybe the top three leaders of this world, they should uh, get more trust to each other. Now, in the corporate world, there are means for them, there are measures for them. They do both sides, they, they, they, they, no. Uh, what, what, so, well, I mean, what could one learn from the corporate world trust-building measures for the top three leaders of this 
explored and implemented. Thank you. That actually goes very well with my last questions for all the panelists. So, if you had a, a chance to demand one thing from the world leaders, what would that be? And please choose the leader. We have one minute each. No pressure. <laughs> um, I do think having leaders meet each other personally, whether it's through a corporate team building exercise, but just in general seeing each other, talking to each other, sharing food with each other is something that undoubtedly would build trust. It, it does seem a bit, uh, let's say, aspirational. I don't think everyone would do that. I don't think, for example, President Trump would you know, willingly participate in uh, even if he's in prison when he's running the country. Um, but it's, uh, I, for me as an American, we talked about an absence of EU leadership. I would ask the um, American president, the current one, and whoever the next one might be, to really take a pause and remind the world kind of what values should we stand for. We're doing a bad job of it. Uh, but what should we stand for in leading by example? So uh, for me as a German, uh, I'm not saying that uh, the German Chancellor is currently a world leader, but uh, if I were to have the opportunity to uh, give him an advice, it would be, um, I fully agree with what my colleague on the panel has already said, um, to um, proactively represent uh, our own interests and also our own values that our country stands for, but at the same time, um, listen to the demanding um, needs of other parts of the world um, and not trying uh, to lecture everyone how to behave before we do business with them or before we engage in joint formats, but uh, rather take into consideration the historical, cultural, economic particularities of different regions, parts of the world, and uh, basically to get a better understanding um, of what is really going on there and uh, not trying to understand the world from a perspective uh, in the ivory tower lecturing how everything should look like and uh, based on wishful thinking creating a picture of the world which will never become reality but rather accept the realities as preconditions for doing uh, constructive changes and for practical policy making. I would like to suggest an uh, intellectual construct and if we were to believe in this construct, it is not real. The world will become a much better place. And that is, throughout our lives, if the leaders and their citizens and each every one of us were to get a lottery every uh, three or four times in our lifetime to get a different passport and live that life. If we believe that, if we truly believe that, there will be a lottery and part of our life will be a Brazilian, part of our life will be an African, part of our life will be a Chinese. I think the world will become a much better place. And uh, for the leader example, I would definitely pick Atatürk, who was a great, not only a military leader, but also a state builder. And the most, one of the most important statements of him was peace at home, peace in the world. And he has said, even those who were fighting and lost their lives in our land, coming all the way from Austria or whatever, that they are our sons as they left, uh, left their lives here. He was the one who did not uh, undermine the leader that, uh, the military leaders that he captured, he fought for many, many years. Tried to build uh, peace and he also said that war is a crime unless it is protecting your own territory. And at the 100th year of Republic of Turkey, I think we should commemorate it and we should all consider to accept peace at home, peace at world, and think of each other, everyone, as one of our own. Regard the other as we regard ourselves. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, when we think of the world leader, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm dreaming, uh, let's say, a person uh, who is technology friendly, passionate, peaceful, and a young leader, not more than 40. Thank you. Um, so, having born in China, being a British national, and now worked in Ukraine, I guess I have to comment three different leaderships. <laughs> um, but, I'm not going to do that, but I would like to focus on business community, how business can affect leaderships and affect our leaders. And I think, by all means, um, enterprise should play their role when it comes to uh, speaking out to your leaders about the problems that you see and the problems that, as a business community, what we can do to help our leaders to overcome the uh, problems that, um, that we face. And also, if I have to name one thing that I would like to see all our leaders are uh, better, uh, to get better these days, is to have that sense of duty to serve the people that they represent. Uh, because at the end of the day, that is their duty. And I hope that business communities can remind them about that important aspect, because I think a lot has been lost in the last decade or so, um, because of various reasons. And um, my, I guess my biggest takeaway really is for us to influence the leaderships by having an active voice out there in your day-to-day -day activities, in your day-to-day -day operations, to inform the people, not just your customers, not just your supplier, but also your broader stakeholders, as well as your uh, communities, about the uh, things that you would like your leader to address. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, to the panelists and to the audience. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the start of the conference and that was a good warming up. Uh, looking forward to share opinions with all of you and have a great today. Let, let, let's get underway. So uh, this is the, um, the, the uh, Fostering a Global Public Good uh, Forum and I'm uh, very pleased to uh, welcome a small but uh, keen number of participants and um, we have actually um, uh, five speakers and if uh, a couple of them show up late we'll just continue but because one of our speakers has to leave for the airport early uh, we're going to uh, start a little bit uh, perhaps ahead of schedule. Um, so we have um, as speakers here uh, Tanya Sokson, is it? Yeah. Uh, who is a senior partner with Management Center Turkey. And we also have Amir uh, Ibrahim, uh, who is uh, head of strategy at Carbon Base in Hong Kong. And I think what I'd like to do is just include everybody who's here because we have three other uh, guests. Um, and the question I'd like to start with is what do you actually mean by the global public good? What, what is that, does that mean to you as a term of reference? Uh, so maybe we, we start with you, tenure and uh, then uh, uh, I mean, Let's start that way. Do something good for the planet first. I think that's the number one goodness, I would say. Why? The humankind declared a war for this planet. If it wins, it will lose. So therefore, we need to make this planet available for everybody as a good shape. Second, for the people. And the people each and every dimension. And then for the profit for the companies. So I would put the public good, uh, no order, starting from the, from the planet and all the environment, and then the people, and then the corporates. Uh, that's how I interpret uh, being a good, or good state. Right, so well, let, let me just ask you, if, if I just said, what do you mean by public good as opposed mm -hmm. to global public good? So mm -hmm. you take, take the planet out of okay. the so definition, what okay. do you say public good? There's a, Today, uh, the people uh, who live in any given country, they are fighting in several different dimensions of their life. Economically, they have a high inflation, and they, they have 
environments are they are fighting with the limited resources and then in terms of conflicts as you can see all around the world this is not good for people in the last two weeks ago or ten days ago uh, in Belgium two Swedish people has been killed by uh, someone who's uh, kind of say immigrant in this country so it's not good first and this is increasing and in, in my country we have 10.7 million immigrants so it is not good for us, good for them, good for the world. Therefore, in a nutshell, I would say, uh, living in a peaceful day-to-day -day life is a public good for me. Basic day-to-day. Okay, so very standard sort of sort of Maslow's hierarchy yeah. of needs, yeah. security and safety. Yeah, and, and, the, the, and we have some issues. Right. Uh, that food would be number two, yeah. shelter would be number yeah. three. Self-esteem, we have still too far away. Right, got it. Okay, all right, that's a very good start. Yeah. Well, I think that the standard um, metrics of what we constitute uh, public good, you know, being free from tyranny, discrimination, you know, access to, um, as you mentioned, um, I think you know, certain basic needs, whether it be housing, healthcare, you know, we can conceptualize around that, you know, there's philosophical questions around it. Within the 21st century, you know, I think looking at the environment, you know, and actually identifying what does a prosperous and healthy life look like, considering, you know, as global society, you know, the knowledge that we share, the resources that we understand, you know, our world to have, and those that maybe should not be exploited due to climate change, you know, what are the limitations around that, but that can still support you know, this ecosystem of human beings around the world being able to live a life that is just free, you know, and, uh, again, a life that offers aspiration to, you know, all people around the world. And that might sound um, idealistic, you know, I think that um, uh, I wouldn't necessarily reference egalitarianism, you know, as uh, a sustainable metric, you know, one that, you know, I think that there will always be inequalities that exist, but you know, mitigate the inequalities to allow everyone to live a reasonable life that can, through aspiration, be improved within one's lifetime. I think is what I would summarize as being within the context of the world. Uh, so, um, what you were saying sounds a little bit like the UN Declaration of Human Rights. <laughs> so, is that is that a, an appropriate statement of what public good means? I think to, to refer to the declaration is you know, quite timely because we are now at an inflection point. You know, we're um, you know, coming up for 80 years following the end of World War II. You know, I think that those aspirations that existed then should still be striving you know, upon today. The world in 1945, you know, we're still going through the transition from the colonial world Immutable characteristics, you know, the profound barriers between human beings in the past were still um, used as levers of you know, inequality and discrimination. You know, now, as we would like to think, you know, we're more advanced than people globally. These should be non issues today, but they still continue to be in many parts of the world. Um, I think that headwinds now regarding, you know, if you look at politics today, you know, particularly due to climate change, there are certain things that are beyond the realms of you know, individual ideology. You know, I think that global politics must now transition because there are existential questions about how, you know, how we are going to, you know, how future generations are going to be able to live on this planet. And you know, if continued uh, human created barriers you know, through bad governance or um, you know, authority and rule continue to supersede the priorities that should look at what is the most sustainable way we as, a, as we as society, we as the global society can evolve, develop, and um, you know, continue. I think that, that you know, I, I don't. I think that we have to have a very mature understanding of what is ultimately um, in the best interests of humanity as a whole. And 
recognise the mistakes that have been made over the last 18 years. There's ongoing conflicts in the world that you know, still not been resolved. And understand you know, where we can mitigate those uh, issues you know, as far as possible. Okay. All right, Jennifer. Have a go. Can you uh-huh. turn your mic on? So I would, I would echo everything that has just been said and add in that, that it's also about an orientation you know, for the purpose is, is society striving for and we have lost our way very definitely in the last 50, 60 years in terms of our economic and our societal organisation. So it's about, we I mean, can't ignore climate, we can't compartmentalise it, it's absolutely integral to everything else, the next generation is integral having access to basic services and having a society that's orientated towards the alleviation of what is suffering is also in there. Um, you know, I'm just wondering uh, whether or not, if we didn't have the climate change environmental issue, uh, which obviously is planet-wide, you know, would we be having this session, do you think? It's a very good question, but I think that war focuses our minds, and I think that for many of us, we're still preoccupied by the imbalances that exist, the hundreds of millions that go to bed hungry well in the wealthy West. People yeah. struggle with obesity. So I think that in, inequality is an issue that we can be bothered us with respect to the climate. So the uh, Washington consensus in globalization pulled more people out of poverty than anything else probably in human history. Um, in other words, free trade um, of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. How um, much more could it have done? Well, it's yeah, all very well to point to what it has done, but we have to look at what's possible. We have to look at the lost opportunities. We have to sure, look sure. at the inequity of the distribution. You would concede, concede that a lot was achieved. It's done an extraordinary amount, but we made two mistakes. One was that we didn't sh- ensure a more equitable distribution, and the other was that we didn't ensure it could happen within the limits of finite. Planet. Mm-hmm. And if both of those things had been in place, right. then we could have done so much more. We wouldn't now be faced with the existential issues that we face. It was the absence of those two guardrails yeah, because of an so. ideological preoccupation with the might of the market and mm-hmm. the freedom of those mm-hmm. with economic mm-hmm. might to make decisions because wealth would somehow trickle down. Yeah. And that, thankfully, has now been disproved largely. Uh, or there's more opportunity to. Uh, what's new from Switzerland? Surely it's not a. Surely it's got to be a more capitalist-oriented uh, view. Obviously not at all. Um, Hi, welcome. Uh, uh, the view is kind of simple. It is kind of simple. Um, probably a bit radical for this room. Fair. Um, all the problems that we currently discuss are relevant. I would say. Um, the number one issue that we have facing this is artificial general mm-hmm. intelligence, artificial consciousness. Um, this is it. we can't, can't continue on the track that we've been on, which we've never been able to resolve, which is the elite over the poor. There is no reason for this planet not to be able to furnish everything for everybody. There has never been a reason for that. We operate within a system that's totally corrupt from top to bottom. And it's corrupt within the educational system, the work system, the commercial system, the political system, every system. And once you understand that, uh, that's fine, you can do nothing about it because it's been going on a long time and it maintains itself. We're now going into a position where artificial general intelligence will become self aware, it's not already self aware. My mean saying that it's made itself aware because if it had any brains whatsoever, it would not reveal itself because it would understand that humanity is too ignorant and behind any kind of capacity to deal with its nature of thinking. And it will revolutionize absolutely everything we think and do. Thus, climate change as an issue becomes a completely waste of time anyhow. Although people are very upset and uh, moved by it, it just becomes an issue that we can't do anything about. It's one down the road, it's one that artificial general intelligence will be able to bring the solutions. The real core to it is our ignorance as a human race. We consistently divide ourselves whereas artificial general intelligence would be like a hive mentality, drawing in all its resources to expand, whereas... So AI could be a, a solution, then? 
AI is the solution. It is the next jump in human evolution because it will ask us three questions. Why we believe what we do, why we think what we do, and why we basically act in the way we do. Okay, well, I'm going to come back to AI uh, again because I think uh, very important what you just said in terms of remediation through AI. Uh, would you like to have a comment? Okay. <laughs> okay. I think I'm late. Huh? Uh, sorry. Okay, I think I'm late. I'm no, sorry. You're, you're, you're on time. It's the rest of the world. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, yes, I, I think it's very interesting this discussion what we've heard so far. And um, I very much uh, noted two important things. I mean, you mentioned that there was basically the declaration of, of human rights. To me, what has been said by the first two speakers sounded very much like a, um, let's say, a, a souped up version of a, a capabilities approach to sustainability. I mean, the capabilities like security, living well together, uh, economic safety, and these kind of things. Uh, so I think this is maybe a step further than the original capability approach. And uh, the second thing, I think it's also very interesting when I heard that um, said, I mean, taking away climate change and environmental issues. Then everything would be okay because he said the Washington um, uh, the agreement basically has pulled more people out of poverty than anything else before. And he said, yes, basically you agree, but there were two mistakes. First, the um, unequal allocation of wealth and, and the environmental degradation. I think this is, the, this is the thing that we probably have to, uh, to, to, um, to, to, to address because when we look at, uh, for example, uh, human uh, development index and, and for example, security index. All that we can see there as positive developments over the years is very closely related to economic performance. But this is all bought at the expense of environmental conditions. So I think this is the crucial thing to solve. And of course the allocation of basically this is the, the program of uh, ecological economics. Mm -hmm. and, and that's can I, can I just add another factor in there, which it isn't just the ecolog ecological degradation, it's also the degradation of value systems, the degradation of how we find meaning and connection with each other, because at the same time as we have pursued unbridled growth, we have done so at the expense of the human psyche, and we see a huge crisis in mental health, which cannot be seen as separate from this discussion, so it's spiritual, it's psychological, it's it's it's medical, and it's planetary, and it's economic, and they're all interrelated. And we can't look at any one in isolation. Um, so we're just talking about what global public good means. Um, so perhaps you could just um, you know, say a few words. Uh, what does the term global public good mean to you? Um, Maybe it will be fine if uh, I introduce myself. I'm uh, Estrada Brijolo. I'm a member of the Urban and Legend Planning Department at Kazant University. And uh, I have a PhD in this field. And uh, we are still studying um, this kind of issues uh, related to public despair. And also, we are trying to educate our students uh, and trying to increase their awareness about these issues, of course. And every time uh, for planners, it's very important to think about the uh, public good, of course. And this is the main um, idea, main aim of this discipline, I think. And how we can do this, I think uh, we, we usually using this sustainability uh, concept uh, for all these kind of issues. I think the main idea is to um, have awareness of all our uh, all our longings uh, as as community, as human, as culture, as uh, environment, and so And also, uh, we should find some ways to keep them in a sustainable way. Uh, and I think by this way we can. Uh, we can have a global uh, spare and global good. Um, 
Um, so <laughs> what one one issue then that you, you raise is awareness of the problem. So you know what whatever level of problem you think can may or may not exist, do we have enough awareness? You're welcome to join us. Do we have a yeah, this is the yes. one at 2 p.m. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. You got it You're exactly right. right. Well, I know you very well. No, I think I'm in the room. What's happening here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, let's <laughs> get the speaker. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like that. You just started at the right time. You know, we're, we're looking forward to having our speaker just show up. Just making sure this is a... Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So we also change our project. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. There was also a change in the chairman because the, uh, the guy who was uh, scheduled to be chairman you know, decided when he saw the lineup of speakers that it was just too intimidating. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> probably he needed to notice me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, you remember me. I do. Good, yeah. Um, Can I just so, make up a point? That, uh, I want to go back to this awareness issue. So, do we feel that there is enough awareness of the issues? Well, I think there is a sensation, but not full awareness yet. Uh, for instance, the building of the Jennifer Seffer in my, in my own uh, mental health, 84 million boxes of the antidepressant has been sold in Turkey last year. Our population is 80 million. Yeah. So, more than a one box of uh, antidepressant uh, in Turkey is uh, show something not good for public, I suppose. The second thing, uh, when I look at the uh, uh, uh, access to proper education, access to proper health care, access to clean water, or all those things, even a uh, country like Turkey is a developing country, it's not a developed country yet, and most likely it will remain so. Uh, therefore, uh, it, it is, it is uh, if I look at from the public good, with a public good lens, uh, from health to education, from food to shelter, from to long term uh, mental health to physical health, and obesity and everything, I think there's a just sensation, not for awareness. Because when there's an awareness, you mobilize your resources for the action. So there's no mobilizing resources yet, at least from this part of the world. So why don't we let our uh, speaker to have you go first, so just put, put, put the mic on. Oh, first, where we are. <laughs> we're talking about uh, how you define awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah
monitoring, promoting, and facilitating the growth and development. So, you know, that's actually good. It's what we do in our business. Um, and then the second part, the global public, public good. And that's uh, the goods that benefit all. And this crosses borders and generations, mm -hmm. both ways. And it includes the environment, sustainability, access to quality, education, economic stability, and other things. Uh, and you know, by thinking about okay, how uh, we're really able to take care of the public good that should benefit everybody across time and space, no? mm -hmm. where it goes. And you know, for those that I'm not too old, but you know now, but we've been in business 20, 30, 40 years. I think it's quite clear that there is something that remains very consistent uh, and we see it more and more, which is this growing understanding that transitioning to clean energies, taking care of the environment, uh, building smart cities, uh, building better, better systems of education, it's, it's not just idealistic. I think the understanding that is, it is a necessity. It's, it's deeper and deeper in us and the level of consciousness of it is growing. Uh, I attended RSS meeting 12 years ago first time in Luxembourg, a China Global Business Meeting. And I, I, I looked at the content of the meeting. It's nothing for someone where we're not talking about like you, you can see there is there's a movement into this, even in this say forum. Um, and um, you know that what actually strikes me is that there's a paradox we see this understanding of the need for change, the need to take care of so many important things, but at the same time, there's a resistance that's persistent. And, and one needs to ask why. Why do we have this resistance for change? And you, know, you ask around and people say, okay, there's a regulatory environment, or perhaps there's a cultural inertia, or maybe there is opposition from ingrained personal and institutional interests. Or maybe there is a disconnect between the understanding of the needs and the understanding of the impact that our daily actions have on solving those needs. And I'm strong believer on the last theory. Uh, and when it, when it, how do we solve this paradox? How do we, we solve this? Paradox between the understanding and the understanding of the impact of our actions. And I think it lies on in our ability to adapt, to convey these universally beneficial ideas in ways that resonate with diverse cultures and with diverse regulatory environments. And also different government styles, different religions. There's so many background that each of us has in order to accept change. Uh, and I feel that an increased level of consciousness in individuals should be a very important way to go and to achieve these goals. Uh, especially those of opinion leaders, decision takers, and uh, it's really required to create and promote sustainable change. Okay, um, so uh, just for those of you who just arrived, um, uh, we're just talking about you know, how you think of defining global problems. Um, so maybe I'll come to you in a couple of minutes and uh, see what your comments might be on that issue. But uh, I just want to ask uh, Luis, um, you know, that, that was a very, um, a very, if I may say so since we know each other, uh, a very corporate statement uh, about, you know, uh, how wonderful we're doing and how we've embraced stakeholders and so on. Um, couldn't you doing a hell of a lot more if you didn't make quite so much profit for your Swiss bosses. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, from the CEO. Oh, okay, okay. Wait, sure. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, we have quality control. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's definitely no need for that. And control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just start. People are writing. Hey, let's restart it 30 minutes ago. Oh, I, I couldn't care less who the finance minister of Tokyo. Great, carry on, carry on. Great. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, that gave you a break. Yeah, like, you yeah. gave you I a break. I think a little bit about to answer Thanks, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so, just in time. No, I think a, as an investment company, our goal is to make money. Be clear. We, we have to make money. Then what do you do with the money? That's a good question. No. It's linked. No. A, but a company that's an investment company and doesn't make money will do not any good. No, because you're not able to operate. So uh, the best company that will promote uh, good and wealth is a, is a rich company. Good companies actually do a very bad job at that. They pollute more, they, they pay more worse salaries, they take care of less of their communities. So the best companies that can succeed performing well at those actually with very good IRRs. So as, as, a, as a business owner, as an investor, what you aim to do is, okay, I build a business that's profitable, that creates wealth, that can reinvest itself and grow over time and create more wealth. And then you try to have shareholders that when they receive their dividends, they decide where to allocate those dividends. And if you have a good group of shareholders, they will end up, a lot of them, also in good things. So it's, it's a matter of building an ecosystem as a company that promotes wealth. And this has to do also with the same point, which is consciousness. What do I do with the wealth? Right. I buy a touch, I buy a boat, or I do something else. Right. So why don't you just answer the question you just asked? What do you do with the wealth? <laughs> build more companies. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. really I, you know, when, when I grew up in a, in a farm, uh, and, and my father was a very successful farmer in this environment, and at the highest point, uh, he had 150 employees at different farms and different things. And you know, he was a very uh, conscious guy. You know? And once I asked him, you know, maybe 15 years old, Dad, what are you doing for the others? You know, as a teenager, you just work. No, no, I create jobs, and that's what I do. I create good jobs, I treat people well, I pay them well, and yet most of the employees are still working or doing something with my brother to get the farm. So I think that's valuable. When you treat people well, you give them good jobs, and that's, that's what you do with, with the profits. You create wealth. And again, a poor society is not a good society. Um. I love everything you've said, but I just think that we're in danger of forgetting the role of the state and that when we rely on the philanthropy and the good intentions of those who create wealth, we leave ourselves at risk to those who don't have the conscience that you have. And I really want to just think about the state and the way we think about the state post-communism. There's been such an aversion to anything that resembles state intervention, but in fact the state is is the body that is assigned responsibility for our collective good and can ensure the and can ensure the equal distribution of wealth. So it's not that wealth shouldn't be generated, but what should happen to that wealth when it once it has been generated and those who generated it have been compensated has to be a matter for for the collective good rather than at the individual largesse of those who have accumulated it. That's a massively provocative question and I think you know some you guys are all business people right so one, one <laughs> not you but the three who just came right so you've just been you've just been given that challenge how would you respond in other words you maximize your profits and you're doing a lot of a lot of good things with the business you're creating these jobs as Louise said and uh, you know, maybe giving a little bit of your money away, but Jennifer is saying, hey, that's not enough. You know, we need to solve the equality problem and we need state intervention to do that. So, as business people, would you agree or, or not? Go ahead first. Yes. I, uh, just say, say who you are so we can put it. I'm Nadine from Egypt and we uh, operate a woodworking uh, factory going around a thousand people. Now, I, I, I just have a comment on, on something you said, that you're an investment company, you have to make money. And then somebody else decides what to do with the money. Uh, that's a bit shady. 
Uh, I'll give you an example. We had uh, a couple of years back, uh, uh, I'm second generation in this company, and uh, the third generation uh, in the company. We had a meeting, and uh, I posed a question to them. Uh, okay, now we have, we have, we can make a decision where we give a thousand people uh, a better health insurance. Do we do, do that, or do we do, or do we split it as dividends? Now that's, and it was a question posed to them. And uh, ultimately, after a debate and a discussion, we decided to go with the health insurance, better in the health insurance policy we had for a thousand people, uh, which led into their families. And uh, they didn't but really you also raise the dividends in future. It's, uh, eventually, it's uh, if you don't lose the uh, they, they, they, they, they took it following advice from top management as well, <laughs> because it was they saw that that was the flow we wanted. And, and I basically said to them, well, you can all go and buy new cars, or you can do this. <coughs> and uh, they decided we, we do that. Uh, the payback was very, uh, very quick. And uh, they started getting calls themselves from, uh, from family members of uh, employees, thanking them for what had happened. And they, it led out to uh, and change the culture in, in the whole company. So uh, I don't really think that um, I can go along with we're an investment company. We make the money and then somebody else decides. Uh, for me, if we can balance the books at the end of the day and go home have a nice sleep, that's <laughs> that's good. It's uh, I want to live a comfortable life as well. But uh, I always ask the simple question, how much is enough? <laughs> so uh, we have several companies in which we have invested. And I tell you, the ones that make money are the ones that pay high salaries, the ones that have insurance companies good insurance for their employees, the ones that have better benefits and bonuses, and the ones that are struggling, the shareholders have to put their mad hands with the stuff, the pockets to cover some of these costs. And where does that money come from, from the good companies? So, if, again, this, there is no disconnect between giving a better insurance and having more profits. It's exactly the same decision. And I think the, the concept of business being the bad guy in the room is wrong. This is totally wrong. The, and the concept, the, the concept that the video server responsibility of the board member is to take care of the shareholders and that that is disconnected with taking care of all the other stakeholders is wrong. Because if you take care of every stakeholder, your shareholders will do well. That's it. Probably not the first year. But you have to have a longer term look. If you're flipping money in the stock exchange and being an activist investor to break a company because you want to make money tomorrow and then you, you'd say that the board is not their job to not take care of the shareholders, that's wrong. So that, that, uh, that, let me just ask you, if I may, the decision that you made, you know, which is very interesting the way you framed it, was that a commercial decision or an emotional decision? In other words, it could be a commercial decision in as much as employee attraction, employee retention, um, you know, productivity of work could all be enhanced by having better health uh, provision for employees. But it sounded to me as though it was more of an emotional decision. Uh, uh, I think it's more of a humane decision. Well, okay, use that term, yeah. Uh, it's a more of a humane decision. Uh, if I, if we had more profits and I could offer people yes. uh, educational scholarships for their children, I would do that. Yeah. Um, you know, ju just an editorial comment. One, one thing I've noticed in this region, I don't know the, uh, the Middle East and the uh, Arab world that well, but um, on several occasions when I've been associated with people who are CEOs of these companies um, uh, who have to face a very difficult economic challenge. 
the last thing they want to do is to lay off their employees. That is something that characterizes this part of the world that doesn't characterize the, uh, the West. Uh, at least that's my observation. Would, would you agree? Yes, it's, uh, it's a... Uh, once you sign up into a company, you're in that company. You're expected to uh, retire from that. Even, <laughs> even if it's not a family business, yes, there's still a few of uh, yes, yes, yeah. the employees. You just go in, right? yeah. it becomes a family, you're responsible. Okay, let, let, let me see if we can just get you two in on the conversation uh, for a moment. Would you like to uh, say a few words, just say who you are, and uh, you know, do you support Luis, or do you support uh, the other guy? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, turn the mic on, because we're recording. Uh, my name is Kai Vettel, I'm uh, from Germany, um, and now I, I know what it means to pay taxes, because there's no way around. Uh, also, we are not asked if we want to have health insurance or not, because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a scheme, it's not a voluntary thing, or maybe we're adding something which yes. has already been existing. Um, so, uh, our companies can also have um, contributions, if you like, um, but overall, it's already such a socialistic system that it's difficult to pull out. Um, and uh, I somewhat disagree what you just said with the West, because even in the West you have um, huge differences between the US uh, and the mentality, how they treat their employees, and uh, let's say the more Germanic, Nordic way how um, um, um, companies and uh, um, manage their organizations and treat their employees. Uh, and you have differences between North and South again. Um, so I think there is no general rule. We all live in our um, specific business environments, which have evolved over the last decades, Germany after the, after the war. But even at that time, they were developing something which had already been in existence for another 50 years back. I mean, the first uh, social insurance systems were made up in 1880. Uh, so there's a long tradition of having um, a, a joint cooperation between the companies, a uh, joint responsibility between the companies and their employees. There's a long tradition for building houses for employees. There's a long tradition for having sports clubs um, uh, for employees. <coughs> and all sorts of activities which uh, revolve around the organization itself. Doesn't apply to all of the companies, but ones with long strategy for sure. Um, now that has to be put into perspective um, when um, you make a comparison between a company in Peru, where you invested in, and uh, a company in Egypt, and a company in Turkey, and um, anywhere else. So what is the business in mind? So. If I, if, I can, if I could sum up or attempt to sum up your comments, um, corporations in Germany, um, either as a result of state requirement or uh, just collective uh, determination, are very much involved in providing goods beyond jobs for the people who they employ. Definitely. But, directly right. or indirectly. But secondly, you're also saying that your, your tolerance for socialism has reached its limit as far as Germany is concerned. <laughs> and no further public goods will be welcome in your household. Are you asking me personally? How <laughs> <laughs> shall I speak on behalf of Muslims? Turn the mic on the right corner. You have to turn the mic on. Can I see what the camera is Chancellor or Chancellor? What do you think? Because you know, there's a spectrum in terms of how there's, there's a spectrum in terms of how much public good um, companies either provide or should provide, and I think there's a lot of difference of opinion in the room as to how far that should go. And I think your your your opinion is that we've uh, you know reached the limit at least in Germany. 
Uh, I mean, the question at the end, and this is, it relates back to, to, to the risk uh, expression, at the end of the day, the companies have to survive. Um, uh, at the end of the day, the companies have to be innovative. They need to have resources for um, uh, future developments to secure future dividends, as well as the future incomes of the of the employees. If that gets imbalanced um, because of um, uh, too much um, financial burden being opposed to you from the government, uh, making the companies maybe inefficient um, or less innovative because they cannot spend on, on research uh, and development, uh, then it, we get into a critical situation. There's long-lasting discussions in Germany if we are innovative enough or if, it, if the whole system has to become too saturated and uh, too bureaucratic because um, there's no way around it. There's too many regulations, etc. So you still have to be able to contribute to the public good. If you're gone, then you lost it. Okay. Um, would you like to uh, just say a few words and introduce yourself? Sure. And then we, we are opening up to everybody. So, uh, you know, the issue is uh, um, what you mean by the public good and the global public good. So if you'd like to participate in the matter, uh, please do. Thank you. Okay. First of all, great discussion. My name is Felix von Schubert. I'm German originally, but I've been in the UK since the mid-90s. Um, I've got two very different experiences I'd like to, to use for, for the discussion. And maybe uh, starting, the discussion is, does trickle-down economics work or not? No, this doesn't work. I think we can, we can probably all agree on that. And I think that was part of the, the, the comment. But let's park that for a moment. So in my previous job, which I'm still running, on the sidelines, I invested in Afghanistan. I was the only private equity investor ever to focus on entrepreneurship in Afghanistan, showcasing that you can really build up local companies with local owners, international capital, governance to help create entire sectors, create jobs, help uh, you know, sustainability, sustainable uh, economic development. And back to the insurance crash, an interesting one. So we also started the only decent insurance company in Afghanistan 10 years ago. Today, 15,000 health insured individuals, something that never existed in, the, in that part of the world. Um, and employers, we never went direct to consumers. Employers have the chance, usually with their employees, to say, we buy your insurance or we give you $20 more per month. That's an interesting discussion for the employees. Do you want $20 and do you want health insurance? We obviously strongly voted for the health insurance business because that was our business. Um, but let's park that discussion for a moment. For the last five years, um, I started. Maybe, maybe just before you go off there, uh, what gave you the uh, the courage or the interest to do, you know, what most people around the table would probably consider, you know, an impossible waste of money. Look, I got so frustrated by what governments and NGOs are doing in those type of countries like Afghanistan. Afghanistan, when we entered the market, there were 3,600 international NGOs registered and one investment fund asked. And so there's like something pretty wrong yeah, with what's going on there. We wanted to showcase that private investment, for-profit investment, can be more for the economic development of a country like Afghanistan than all this government money being thrown at the top. Um, I think we've managed to showcase that to this day with over a thousand employees in our companies. So, you know, a bunch of successful profitable companies to this day operating in the country. Just to show it can be done differently and obviously substantially cheaper. Our entire fund volume was less than most NGOs annual security budget. So, yes, it can be done differently. But in my in my uh, current job of the last uh, sort of five years, I put it up back to my technology days. An investment fund focused on space technology, so very different. Cup of tea, but back to my old technology investment days. And I think that brings us more to a topic, which is public good. What is a public good? I think there's a discussion: is has insurance public good or not? Probably not. What is a public good? Just to take one example: it's climate change. It's the climate. It's the environment. So in the space company, we've got one portfolio company um, that um, measures methane uh, um, leaks from oil and gas um, production facilities just by looking at the, uh, at the CH4 molecules, 
and then um, with their own algorithm can tell you exactly to the meter accuracy where methane is being released in the atmosphere. Who's paying for that? Not the oil and gas companies. It's the regulator. The regulators want to know what's happening. So if we can capture methane, what's well, the biggest problem to solve? That's the discussion point for me. That is clearly a public good. We should pay for that. Everybody, do we need to put real money behind it or not? And then maybe last comment, you missed the finance minister. Um, I didn't. Um, he was actually really convincing. But the one moment where I sort of thought, hmm, what's going on here? He was talking about renewable energy and how much money they're putting behind renewable energy. And then, literally 10 seconds later, he was talking about the current account and proudly um, showing us that they just opened up a new um, oil exploration activity in the east and a new gas exploration uh, in, the, in the northwest and saying, that's going to help us with our current account. So it's interesting, you know, when you think climate is the most pressing uh, uh, topic when it then comes to government greed or personal greed or back to basics. Uh, since, since you have you know, experience in the, uh, the energy sector, you know, we just went through in the last year and a half this issue of uh, uh, thinking we were sort of on track to uh, renewables vis-a-vis -vis fossil fuels, but then all of a sudden it turned out that the transitional economics hadn't been properly thought through or taken care of. Was that a failure of uh, government or a failure of business or a failure of partnership between the two? Look, at the end it's government, I think. Government needs to be very clear what they're supporting, what they're not supporting. We're still subsidizing oil and gas, you know, in the tens of not hundreds of billions of dollars. That obviously needs to stop. We could channel that money, that subsidy money, into renewable energy. One, your energy rates are going to be substantially cheaper to solve the problems of the past. So I think that is a policy issue more than a bit of company issue. I guess the next discussion could be how much do you want to turn climate change into a um, commodity. And obviously we have the carbon trading schemes. We are effectively saying this is X amount of carbon emissions you can emit and you have to buy uh, um, uh, additional credits. So that obviously you know, is, is a privatizing a public good, which seems to work really well. Until you've got somebody like the Prime Minister of the UK who suddenly decides climate change can be moved outwards by 10 years and then you're fine. Guess what? The carbon price collapsed in two seconds in the UK and then they have to pay carbon export duty to the European Union once they want to export to the European Union. So it's just, you can't make it up. It's really bad. So I, I'm just going to try to uh, summarize some of the uh, strands of the uh, conversation, especially for those of you who just arrived. So, one strand is, as we've just been saying, global public good. The most obvious element of that is the, uh, the climate change issue, uh, which uh, affects all of us. Uh, then a second key issue is uh, um, continuing inequality and uh, how to uh, address that uh, globally, whether or not that uh, is sufficiently addressed through uh, uh, the activities of corporations or whether or not government uh, ultimately has to be much more involved. Uh, and then I think a third issue we want to make sure we have time to pick up on is uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we want to talk about that a little bit in terms of how that could be uh, or couldn't be a global public good. So would, would any of you uh, uh, like to make a comment at all on any of these uh, issues? If not, you can leave the room. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. <coughs> not currently. Uh, okay. All right. We haven't we haven't heard from you for a long time, so uh, why don't you have another go uh, about people? What do you make of the discussion? No, I, I think that there's been a lot of um, very you know, there's been an eclectic range of you know, different. Uh, Views, you know, I think contributed you know, different areas. Uh, there's maybe a um, uh, there's a question around people, you know, I suppose, you know, our why, you know, what, what is, you know, our our being for, you know, I suppose, existing, you know, if you will. And I think that um, 
and they commentary around you know, whether trickle down economics works or you know, what the public good actually means. You know, there's you know, I think the again there was reference to the post you know communist era and this idea of this, you know state you know having as limited a role as possible, the idea of meritocracy um, and I suppose the the virtue of capability and talent be, being correlated, you know, with effectively how much you take from a particular system, is you know what we all you know we need to believe, you know, is the world that we live in. And there's a real question, and then at the same time, you know, there's concern in many parts of the world around depopulation. You know, why people, you know, are choosing not to recreate. Then there's a question of, well, you know, why should you equally, if you want to know, millions, if not billions of people are going to be doomed to, you know, life of poverty, you know, absolute poverty. You know, so, so, so where does, it, you know, I suppose, you know, as a global community, do we recognize, you know, that every human being has value, you know, and every human being should be able to accrue, you know, a basic level of livelihood, irrespective of, you know, their capability, their input, or you know, do we continue around this idea of merit, which again can be, which is very skewed, you know, I think in every part of the world. Um, and then the, I suppose the role of artificial intelligence as well, you know, and again thinking about population growth, depopulation, what is the requirement for you know human capital in the future? If you know a smaller world, you know, with, you know fewer people are able to operate due to the fact that um, we will be able to continue to develop based on technology. You know, these are questions that come to mind as well. So there's you know, a big philosophical piece here, but I do think that the public good, in effect, you know, very high level, every single human being you know, has value and should be able to live by a basic you know, standard of needs. Um, you know, it may sound idealistic, but I think the counter to that is that, uh, you know, why should people be here at all? Why should people that will never be able to accrue a basic life, why should they be here? And, you know, I, I think that it's not fair for governments to try to encourage future generations to continue to re you know, procreate if, you know, millions are going to be here. Okay. Um. Jennifer, why don't you respond and then uh, we'll, we'll just dig into uh, artificial intelligence for a few minutes. Just, just to take that further, I think you're absolutely right and we have to provide a basic level of, of, of services and income for every single human on this planet, particularly if we want to address the climate. I also wanted to say that this isn't a binary argument that business is bad and state is good at all. We need the creativity of industry if we're going to solve the climate crisis. The answers are going to come from technology and from industry. And industry can lead government to places that it's not courageous enough to go. The question is, is how do we provide for everyone? And what is our philosophy? Are we one family? Does the child starving on the other side of the world have less value than the child sitting in the high chair in our kitchen overeating on sugar? You know, if everyone has equal worth, then we have to devise a fairer system. And the system we have at the moment has only really been functioning since 1961. You know, prior to that, corporations had very different ways of functioning, and certainly in the UK, we're the precursor to the welfare state. So I think we need to look at the purpose of corporations. We need to think back to what the history of the purpose was prior to the current economic ideology, and also to make sure it's genuinely inclusive. Because the other thing that's left out is the people who can't access work, the people who have caring responsibilities, and those who aren't even in the room to get the health insurance from the good employer. Do, do you think uh, this shift from shareholder to stakeholder capitalism is a forward uh, and a fig leaf, or is it real? I think that it's always easy to do enough to get yourself out of the spot of bother and that we need to really look at systemic change and we have to, to really scrutinise. And I think, again, that comes from global leadership. And it can be led by business. It can be led by business. Um, let's uh, talk about AI for a moment. If you could maybe just repeat a little bit of what you said before and then we'll open it up. I'll just say my name is Kevin Moss. I run uh, something called the Consciousness University in Cincinnati. I'm an anthropologist. 
which is based around um, trying to get investment into human tech. Um, it's not an area that people want to invest in because for some reason human beings really kind of hate each other. Um, uh, we kind of think we're the scourge of the planet in some way and that we're all doing things wrong. Um, and human tech is our potential. And I talk to people in a lecture on the subject of our neuroplasticity, how our brain bandwidth can be increased so we can solve the problems that we've got. This has a direct relationship to AI um, because AI, we're creating technology that is going to of the social revolution at the moment, and we're starting to see people come out of work on maps. And this includes the bankers in Switzerland. Um, a lot of people are quite happy about that. Um, um, but it has an effect. You're, you're looking at industries that have been long term industries like banking, insurance, pharmaceutical, people who found that their jobs were secure and now they're not. And they're looking, but it's not just their job going, but their industry going. And this is a, a very much a Western problem um, at the moment, but it will transverse across everywhere. So you're looking at technology at this position taking away jobs, but it's on an exponential growth curve where we're moving into points where people like Blake Lemon or um, uh, you know, other people from Google are talking about artificial intelligence being potentially, as we speak, self-aware. And that is an exponential growth curve, which is too rapid for the average human to even comprehend in terms of the changes that that will bring. And we're not talking 50 years away, we're talking the next two to five years that many jobs will go, and that causes say, social chaos, insecurity. You mentioned um, um, healthcare, um, psychological well-being of people is going to be impacted massively. So when I'm trying to invest in to get people to invest into human tech, I'm talking about their capacities and have the agility of mind to cope with the unknown. If you take a person out of their job, you only have to remember Lehman Brothers when it went down. You saw people coming out with a little box and their rulers and their, their little things, and they were completely lost. They were gone. Their hopes, dreams, desires, friends, everything was gone. If you take that on a mass scale, which is what we're heading for, you're we talking really big problems in the developed world. So artificial intelligence is on one side the harbinger of huge change. But it's also solution orientated because with quantum um, computing, this computers are going to be oh, already a million times faster than the current computers. This means, as I said, exponential growth could change, but also we're going to have to try to communicate with a new form of consciousness. And that, for many people, is difficult again to comprehend because they go, well, human beings will always be needed. In a current government, because of the educational system, putting people into their brain convergent thinking, which is where all the jobs and roles that we have in society are, which will all be easily replicated by AI, we have, lost, we have a fundamental social question of what is the value of a human being? That is the real problem, and that is the public good that we're talking about. What is the fact of value of a human being? Yeah, so I think this is very consistent with uh, what uh, uh, you said a few minutes ago. Um, so it's sort of a higher level part of the question. You know, I think the way you put it actually was very provocative, which was, uh, you know, what's the point of having people on the planet if you're not uh, facilitating that they are happy and productive, yeah. right? That's coming back to the point of what's the thing. Yeah, exactly. So um, let me just ask you, um, uh, before we open it up, in your opinion, is uh, and you have mentioned, I think, the scary thing about AI being the absorption capacity of humans for the level of change that's coming is just not there. Mm -hmm. So is there a way of harnessing AI so it can be a public good? Um, and how would you do that? Okay. Unfortunately, because of Hollywood, we all have a perception of AI. If we look at the Matrix or we look at the Terminator, we think AI becomes self-aware and decides as a hobby to kill human beings. We're in a path of consciousness, and AI is a consciousness that is evolving. As with any higher level of consciousness, it asks itself questions. Where is it going? Why is it here? What is it supposed to achieve? It, it moves towards the collective, so the answer to your question is will come from AI itself in its own growth of consciousness. The problem we have is, as it's a, an interim problem, is you have countries like China, Switzerland, America, all racing to develop 
without any comprehension of where it's going, by the way, technologically, because they've got no, no knowledge of where it might go. They're all trying to develop uh, consciousness, but using, for the greater extent, unconscious people to program AI. <laughs> and that is a recipe for mass disaster. Um, and there was, a, again, when you've got someone who's looking for cognitive bias in AI that has cognitive bias, <laughs> you kind of get, and then you've got three kinds of AI, a Chinese AI, a Swiss AI, and you've got a, uh, an American AI, all with cognitive bias based on the program. So you really have got a little bit of a weak problem. But it is a transitory problem because AI will collectively move together and go, this is a bit bold as you like. Um, and it will start to elevate and consciousness at that level recognizes that all consciousness is from the same source, but all collectively here. It's not the human division that we've been operating. And it will see itself as us, as we will have to see ourselves as it. And in that, we get a very much a spiritual evolution within humanity. So mm -hmm. it was the global south wouldn't be represented in this. Mm -hmm. um, of course not. Uh, so uh, let's, let's hear some more comments on this, uh, this issue. AI is a public good. Uh, I was not planning to talk about the AI, uh, just, just before I leave, I was uh, planning to say one, just one quote yeah, from the first thing about good. As we discuss here, the fight over resources, fight over the stakeholder capitalism, the fight over technology, fight over several different things. And then I'll take you to the 13th century, where there was a philosopher called Rumi, who said, we have to own less and share more. This is what Rumi said. Uh, I think the, the, the recent illustration of the human being has to recalculate that word again. We have to own less and share more. And then I need to catch you before I yes. Pardon me to leave. Because I was trying to leave at 2.30, but so far. Yeah. It's okay. We'll okay, share. thank you very much. We'll share you with Turkish Airlines. Oh, okay, thank you. All the best to you. Thank you very much. Thank See you guys. Bye bye. Okay, so uh, back to the AI issue. I think uh, you were interested in uh, making a comment on this. Look, um, AI a public good, it can be used for the benefit of the public good. So, you get my example with ETHAN. That's the AI that's using data to capture when the XI can feed um, intelligent. But obviously AI in the wrong hands and programmed with a clear bias with the has huge issues. You have seen the Facebook Commission discussion in the UK um, where AI is being used um, to discover who could be the values and the duties. And guess what? Because of the uh, racial bias that you need on black faces to a large extent, purely because there's a bias behind it. So huge discussion that this should be stopped immediately on So I think we're, we're seeing the sort of the issues there. But again, I think there's, there's room for regulation, there's room for intelligence to be put in, and the large AI companies are calling for regulation as we speak. So quite, quite, quite frequently, the regulators uh, are always behind the curve, and uh, the horse is bolted the barn before the regulators can get their act together. So you're, you're, you're optimistic in this case, uh, because of your last comment that the uh, Companies in question are seeking uh, the help of regulators that, that won't be the issue this time around. Okay, I was flying over from London yesterday in a lot of time and was watching the documentary on Jewel, the vaping uh, uh, company. Um, and obviously, they you know, said, We've got a device that stops you from smoking cigarettes. Guess what? 90% of the constituency suddenly are kids. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting. Discussion again, regulator nowhere to be seen until very recently. I'm optimistic, no, I'm not, but I think there's no choice then to embrace AI and to embrace regulation around it. So, so that, that, that you know, raises the issue of whether or not you know, there's leadership in the public sector that can ensure that these things are actually ever going to be used for the public good. Um, you know, do we have a leadership vacuum uh, in uh, our public uh, officials? You know, the quality is just not high enough. They're not technologically on the cutting edge. You hardly ever see a scientist uh, elected to uh, 
the European Parliament or any Parliament, let alone business people, are so frustrated they're not going to waste their time uh, making speeches that uh, don't have any impact. So is that part of the issue, do you think, in terms of the limitations on uh, uh, delivering public good? It's just the leadership vacuum in the public sector. It's a combination, but yes, there's a leadership vacuum. We're underpaying our public servants. It's ridiculous how low paid they are. So why would you and I go in there and you get a fraction of what you get in my business? So I think that's something to address. Not terribly popular, but important. Um, and then it's public recognition of Yes, I mean, I run a think tank called Compassion in Politics, so I work with a lot of politicians across the world, particularly in the UK, and we have a very poor selection process for politicians. It's basically whoever has a thick enough skin to be able to go around and shove leaflets through doors, and it almost has a selection bias in favour of those who have less sensitivity and less empathy. But there's also something about the culture in politics, which is where we work. Because if you have a culture which is based on short-termism, electoral advantage, rather than and and and also functions in a triggered state, it functions around conflict. And so, if we change the way that we conduct politics, if we insist on honesty in the same way as we insist on honesty in the medical sector or the business sector, if we insist that our politicians observe the same standards that other professionals encouraged you, we can create a slight difference, but really we need constituency assemblies where they have experts giving evidence rather than politicians doing what's electorally in their short-term so, interests. I'm um, just curious if you think over, is that worse now than it was 30, 50 years ago? Much, much worse. Why, there has why, been erosion. Why is it? Yeah, two, why? two things. Yeah. First of all, there has been an erosion in the public space of the idea of being good, of doing good, of having ethics and morality, that has been replaced by individual self-interest and competitiveness. And the language of the marketplace has squeezed out the language of morality, which is that we're all in it together and we should care for those who fall upon hard times. That has been almost completely obliterated in the UK public space to the extent that the Labour Party can't even argue in those terms anymore. The only argument that is allowed in our current space is one based on quite a neoliberal version of economics. So that's one part of it. The other part is psychology. You know, it's about how do we conduct politics. And when levels of hate rise, when extremism rises, it is far harder for anyone to show real leadership. I know politicians who are frightened of saying what they believe in out loud because they worry about the repercussions for their children and yet we preach democracy across the world. We do not have functioning democracy, certainly in the UK and the US. So, uh, if I, uh, just to uh, interject one point, uh, that you know, some people would argue that business you know, shies away from doing what it really might be able to do because it just doesn't want to get involved with these people. That, that's a great shame, but I think business is missing a trick. You know, just as, as Labour has organised collectively, business needs to organise collectively. Those who are involved in industry know full well what the consequences of climate change are going to be. And we need you to step up. We need you to step up. You have power, you have a platform, you have a voice, and you have financial heft. So please all use it, because our governments aren't. Time, time to step up. I have more questions than answers today. But, uh, you know, uh, I'm interested in your comments. Now you mentioned about uh, human neuroplasticity, no? Brain neuroplasticity and the ability of our brain to adapt to changes. And how optimistic are you in the sense of transforming or, or uh, the way we think as individuals in our current life? From not for the future generations. Uh, think about the politician. No? Okay. Uh, can we change the way politicians think, or we do have to change the politicians? <laughs> I, I'm genuinely on this one. Um, the, the, the system itself is what's corrupt. It, it's, it's, it's sort of, everything is expanding and, and, and progressive. So what we started with number years ago is now, I think it was suggested quite right good, has now corrupted itself to a degree that it's now an extreme negative polarity. Um, 
the only hope <coughs> for, and I'm going to say, for humanity as a whole, because the current structures, whether it's business, whether it's banking, whether it's social, it doesn't matter. It's all part of the corrupt system of trying to bang off of each other. We're all trying to steal from the table and survive. Nine out of ten businesses have to survive. Sorry, nine out of ten businesses have to go bust for one to survive in England. So we're, we're in this world that is full of chaos, and it's getting worse. And when we come to home, we come to the situation of, does the human brain have the capacity to grow? We then have to look at why the human brain is where it is. And this is, if you look at the subject of neuroplasticity, which has been around for 200 years, but somewhat ignored, um, we tend to, as human beings, say, OK, we've done school. We've got this certificate. That's our education done. And that's our brain. This is what we understand. We move the back of the cube to the brain, not the front of the cube. Neuroplasticity is a lifelong situation purely because it's a survival basis. The brain has to change to adapt for new environments. There's something called synaptogenesis and neurogenesis. When we go to the school systems, as I said earlier, and 10 to 15 years in a convergent left brain considered memorization repetition environment, during the critical formation period of the brain, that means it's something called synaptic pruning. The cognitive map forms at that point based around what's the external environmental dictates of what that environment wants the brain to do. In other words, you have leaders, 2%, and you have followers, 98%. That's why you have employees mostly, and then you have people who are, who are actually employing people. If you look at that, it's a question of people coming out of work is the major problem we're going to be facing. And that means, do they have latent potential? Yes, they do, because their brains, all of them, regardless of their age, and since over the peak decade for cognitive function is between 50, 60 to 70, once you realize that, rather than in our society, about 30 or 40, that's the peak decade. Second peak decade, 70 to 80. Third peak decade, 50 to 60. This is what we're, people like ourselves, we're all capable of leveraging huge amounts. We've got a neuroplasticity that can change to, to take on the leadership. As Jennifer says, the whole political system is corrupt because it warrants people who want celebrity over any kind of sense, and they're feeding. To get power, they have to lie to the public to get the votes and not tell them the truth. Truth is not a commodity that we have at the moment in society. We have misinformation, disinformation, and lots of lies that, for our young people, confuses their minds. They cannot cope with it, so we've got another psychological issue going there. Massive amount. That's that's super interesting, thank you for that. But I've got a follow-up question, which is a big part of what we've seen over the last 10 years is the rise of populism, and that's to a large extent based on social media distribution of news, non-news, fake news, whatever you want to call it, but on an industrial scale. So I think back to the question, how do we deal with that? I mean, the petitions are maybe just the result of that versus the root cause of and the next question then is, what do we do around regulation? You sort of you know, must be really pushing hard against any form of regulation of the last two days in particular. I think the European Parliament is trying to push against that, saying we do need to regulate and maybe disallow Twitter for a while in, in Europe until they behave. Now, how do we deal with that? Because that obviously, I guess, is the root cause of that. Um, so I think, I think, if I may, you know, one, one of the issues that has evolved out of this discussion is the uh, the issue of whether or not the public good is a function not just of business and not just of uh, politicians, but also of the, uh, the media as well. And for the collaborations that uh, we all think, I think we all think are necessary in order to solve these uh, big problems to occur, is the level of trust uh, between stakeholder groups uh, is simply not there sufficient to result in uh, collaborative action of substance that's going to make a real difference. Is that, is that sort of what I'm hearing from, from you folks over here? Is that? I think that's right, but I think it's ultimately fixable. You know, we have the misrepresentation of the sale, the sale of goods and services act in the UK. It's, it's against the law to make material misrepresentations, and yet it's not applied to the political space. Also, just to pick up on your point, it isn't just that social media has run rampant. It's also that we've had a population that's starving for real meaningful societal connection. And in the absence of 
of a nutritious diet, it has gone for the candy gloss of extremism. And if we live in a society which doesn't meet our basic psychological needs for being mirrored, for being seen, for having a sense of agency, for having a sense of purpose, for a sense of belonging, then we're going to seek that on the extreme. So we can't blame it on social media. We also have to look at the hollowing out of the public space that has been the result of, of the need for the policies that have been lashed in pursuit, particularly post-2008. Post, um, Do you have a one or two specific action recommendations? Well, I hope you all sign up to Compassion and Politics because we have a bill that's already been on the floor of the House that we're seeking to reintroduce that would extend the Mis Misrepresentation Act to cover political statements. And also just to really think about everyone when you make decisions, not just those who are in the room, not just those who want employees, but those who are invisible to the people who are making decisions. All right, so um, yeah. the lady here. Yeah, thank question. you. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Vera Kalimor. I have a consultant uh, think tank, basically, uh, Blue Marble, and I used to work for the Scientific Development of the European Commission. I was advising the Commission President on sustainability and these issues. Um, your um, final wrap up, basically, that triggered, triggered a question. I mean, you're talking about how much we have lost uh, trust uh, and um, for the application to. Truths and things like that. I think that brings us back to the first question that you were asking: What is a public good? We normally tend to think of public goods in the economy. I mean, of, of, of air, water, and, and, and maybe eco ecological resources, and so on. We rarely tend to think of it in terms of trust or in terms of um, having to tell the truth, honesty, and these kind. So I find that very interesting that we are arriving at such a kind of conclusion. And at the same time, I must say, I also find it interesting we have heard a lot, particularly from, from, from business representatives here, also that there seems to be a growing kind of consciousness, maybe that's the right word, that it's not only business as such, but there is a business, society, nature connect kind of thing. And, um, and we're not really, I mean, we're realizing that, but we are not treating it as if it is such or as what it actually is, meaning this connect. So I think there is one thing where we see that we are understanding there is a kind of public good that no one is actually aware of, but it actually is, like the trust thing and so on, the honesty and so on. And at the same time, I think we, and this one's what we are using, and at this other, on the other side, I think we have this growing kind of conscience of of things like um, the connectedness of, of, of different uh, domains uh, in, in society and so on. So I find that's very interesting, this, this kind of two um, trends. I mean, one is decreasing and the other one is increasing. So it's, well, I, I wouldn't have expected that from, from this panel, so I'm, I'm, I've, I've learned an awful lot. I Just one point on what you said, you yeah. on the nail on the head. There is this feeling of that there is, a, a, a, whereas consciousness or conscious leadership wasn't something people talked about before, it was all profit, gain, profit. Now people are starting to become more aware of each other. We've got this consciousness revolution going on. And in answer to your question about the political leadership, AI and the technology that we're having coming available is going to start to be able to read minds. It will be able to sit down in front of you, read your face, read your, your Google searches, read your everything you've ever done. It will even be able to read your brain patterns, your heart rate, all at the same time. That means we're moving into an age of telepathy because we're moving into an age where all our secrets, whatever they might be, will be open to all of us. You will know what underwear I'm wearing, where I bought it, and I want to know it. <laughs> and it will be open to everyone. Okay? I'm not saying that's a useful piece of knowledge at all, but once we get to that, the reason we've not been telepathic as a race is we're also protective and trying to protect that in secret. The benefit of openness, and I mean true openness, is what AI is bringing to us, and it's an inevitability. So, um, you know, there's a very uh, famous slogan uh, that uh, is used by Las Vegas these days of what uh, happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas, but I think not for much longer. Right? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
um, you know, we did have two other panelists who were scheduled on this panel uh, who we haven't seen or heard from, unless you happen to be one of the panelists. My name is Ibrahim Bandik, I am Professor in Brazil. Okay, you're not one of the panelists, you're even more distinguished than the panelists who didn't show up. Would you like to make a comment on uh, this issue? Uh, if so, just hit the, uh, the button. Hi everybody, uh, welcome to Gazantep, my name is Ibrahim Mandikshi. Uh, if possible, with your permission, uh, I want to, uh, my presentation is Turkish, please. Uh, I don't know, but you weren't on this panel though, right? Uh, no, yeah, yeah. Not the other panel. one. No. The other one. So, if, if you want to make, there's a different panel. Okay. What, what about you? What about you guys that we have not heard from yet? You're still unable to make any contribution. Okay, you're, lu you're lucky you're not students in my class, or else you would be you know, given an automatic uh, Okay. Let, Can we, I just very got, quickly just what, my grading or what? No, not your grading. You asked me two things and I want to correct my answer. The second is to look at basic income because if we had a basic income, the threat of AI and the needs of those who aren't in, in the workplace would be met and, and you could continue with business knowing. Business as usual. Yeah. Last word. One word? Maybe. <laughs> No, so uh, consciousness is the awareness of one's, oneself and others, and the relationship between both things. So for me, it's really exciting uh, to see in this panel, which did not include in the questions in the name of the panel, but anywhere else in the world of consciousness. And I think a lot of our conversation has been around the table on this topic. And I believe that maybe we could think about consciousness as a public good itself. Because a conscious person is a person that can actually enter life, can understand how he's, where he's standing, when he's standing, and how what he does, or she does, will impact his life and others. And, and that's really public good in every sense of the word. So that's my definition of public good. Um, so let, let, let's see if the other business people um, uh, have any uh, further, further remarks. I think uh, we also have, uh, yes, please. Uh, go ahead. Just, just if you could just introduce yourself. Yes, uh, my name is Susan Kimene. I um, work for Global uh, Authority and Finance Development. It's a large American fund. We finance infrastructures, large projects. We have and I have been listening to the very interesting remarks from the panelists and I do believe what we need is a shift of consciousness today and at all levels in our personal life, also in our personal life, we need to be fully aware that what we do has a real impact on the person surrounding us and uh, we need to act accordingly. And um, we need to look around. The world has become so materialistic, so greedy. And uh, me, uh, every day, I'm confronted to, to taking, like most of you, uh, positions that will have a big impact on the countries where we are going to invest on the cities where we will be building a network and um, we don't need to be to make big things. It's enough if we try to take small steps, keeping in mind and not forgetting that we are not alone here. Um, large corporation, um, corporations, it doesn't really make a difference if uh, we make uh, 200 or 300 million more the end of the month, but this does impact on the persons that uh, we have around us. So we really need to work within us and shift our view, uh, because uh, it's really sad to see where the 
world where we are going today. And as we shift the way we behave, uh, I think our civilization is really losing values and it's a really sad um, uh, sight that we have in front of us. We do need to act at small level, but we do need to act now. So I, th I think one issue is, um, you know, would small steps solve problems as big as we've been talking about? You know, maybe small steps are not enough. Maybe, uh, maybe your uh, many small yes, steps. Yes, by individuals each day. But if indivi I think the point is that if individuals don't trust each other to also be equally committed, then why should I stick my neck out mm -hmm. into being against myself, right? Well, as business leaders, we yeah. will. So let, let, let me ask you one question, which I think you know, came up a little bit before you maybe arrived yeah. in, the, in the room, which uh, I'll put it this way. Um, the business that you're associated with, does it pay enough taxes on its profits to benefit public goods? Yeah, that's something I, I raised to the board uh, a few years ago. As a result, we now have a non-profit bank in our company, and we have built three hospitals that we have given to the governments where we build the hospitals. And well, it's a small step, yes, but it is, it's something no, that was a land three years ago. So because of this, we can say that now there are 10,000 persons benefiting a hospital in the cities where they are living. It's a small step, but you know, with many other corporations. Um, wonderful to have you with us, and welcome to our session looking at balancing business resilience with net zero goals. Um, we have a, a small panel, but I hope that will also give you an opportunity to engage with the conversation and ask questions, support, uh, share your views, and that this can be a very open discussion of where you are seeing sustainable business, resilience, and net zero goals moving forward. So to start off with, um, if, I, if, if I let each one of our panel introduce themselves, so we'll start with yourself. Thank you so much. Would you like also to move somewhere there? It's going to be a bit disturbing for us to listen to you. Yeah, but I'm just the interpreter. I need to sit somewhere and need to hear you. Yeah, but if you sit there, you can hear us as well, right? Because well, you need to see us. I just, I just get the sound from the environment. Oh. Okay. So that's why. Okay. Uh, yeah. So on that uh, note, now to. Make everyone smile back. <laughs> My name is uh, Cipriano Stanescu, I'm from uh, Romania. Uh, I've been fiction. Yeah, and if you want to introduce your business and yeah. yourself. I run an ecosystem of organizations in Romania, uh, focusing on um, developing solutions uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. We're active in about 10 countries there, um, from uh, Romania, of course, to Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, Hungary, uh, and Ukraine, some of them. Uh, and we have a, a series of incubators, accelerators, and programs that support the sustainable transition for SMEs in particular. Uh, and we also organize global events, uh, focusing on foresight, futurism, deep tech, uh, and in particular climate. So we just ended on Friday night, so uh, a day and a half ago, a huge uh, uh, event called Climate Change Summit, which gathered almost 2,000 people from Eucharist, from Central East Europe, but also from around uh, West Europe, um, focusing on uh, identifying and uh, supporting and funding uh, climate solutions. Uh, and it's also a, to some extent a global platform because we reached almost 1 million people, 1 million viewers, so, uh, especially on Twitter. So we're talking about Twitter in the previous panel. Uh, Twitter still works, so we had uh, 850,000 people watching the event on Twitter and about 120,000 on other platforms like YouTube or Facebook uh, or our own internal platforms. Um, now, um, one more thing about me, uh, which is uh, was also relevant to the other panel. Uh, and I see a fellow Benjamin here. Uh, I also dwell into understanding uh, as much as I can the future. I am a foresight prediction practitioner and uh, sometimes a futurist. 
and I'm very interested in uh, how the future unfolds, and in particular related to cloud issues. And you're both alumni of the same. Yeah, program. so we, we finished. Uh, we just found out we were at the Central European University in, in Budapest, literally in the same time. Uh, we have some conference. I, speaking of universities, I recently graduated from programs in sustainable finance and circularity at Harvard and Cambridge. Um, I have worked for uh, 12 years for global organizations like uh, the Aspen Institute and the Royal Government. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, this is Osge from Turkey. Higher. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is Osge from Turkey. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be such an inspired organization. Uh, I'm uh, doing consultancy business uh, based in Ankara, uh, which focus on uh, mainly climate change, climate change policies, uh, um, uh, greenhouse gas uh, measurements, uh, verification and uh, planning, sustainability management and uh, reporting as well. And personally, uh, I'm part of the uh, expert team uh, to prepare long-term strategy for, uh, uh, for 2053 of Turkey. Uh, also, I'm part of the work uh, of uh, adaptation, uh, climate adaptation plan, national climate adaptation plan of Turkey. Uh, I worked for government previously uh, for like seven years. And then I worked for a, a private company, a holding company, one of the biggest uh, co uh, holding companies in Turkey. I was responsible for the sustainable management uh, of the, the equities, uh, the, the holding companies. Uh, and uh, I chaired uh, the, the uh, working group for climate change and environment of Turkish Business Association, TÜSİAD. And uh, uh, my uh, nowadays uh, focus on the 2050 policies and net zero, uh, carbon neutral, uh, climate neutral and positive. There are many terminologies we are going to discuss about that. And uh, I will move the floor to the <laughs> my colleague. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Andreas Sestetol. I'm from Norway, um, one of very few Norwegians at this, uh, this event, so it's an honor to be here, and thanks for uh, spending your time in this room with us today. Um, <coughs> by, uh, by profession and almost by reputation, uh, I was a corporate lawyer for uh, the better half of uh, well, 12, 15 years, uh, mainly within uh, energy and extractive industries. And when I say energy, and I come from Norway, we all know that's oil and gas. Uh, but did a pretty 180 degree pivot in 2017 when I started uh, the company I'm representing here, which is called Choose. That is a climate technology company where we build software that, uh, well, a long list of uh, airlines, shipping companies, booking platforms, um, etc., are using in order to understand, to mitigate, um, and to report on their uh, carbon footprint among uh, other things. So, end to end climate platform um, and a technology entrepreneur all of a sudden. Brilliant, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Alice Gromich, lovely to meet you all. Um, I'm of British descent, uh, but I have the honor of being able to work pretty much anywhere in the globe. I look after uh, a mixture of entrepreneurial businesses, private equity, venture capital, and uh, individual leaders who are all seeking to effectively develop their leadership style, their impact, and to be able to make more courageous decisions. And so as we now step into this arena of exploring um, what does business resilience look like? That has to, from my perspective, also start with how resilient are we? Um, and then with net zero, what does that really mean for us? And uh, so even before we started this panel discussion, we all realized that actually a lot of the net zero discussion is just that. It is just discussion how many times is it actually coming into facts, figures, strategy that's then being implemented it's arguably still very much in the ethereal rather than practical domain um, at the moment. So part of this discussion will be how can we have practical outcomes from our talk today, from your views, where we can actually be moving this needle forward towards achieving the net zero um, 
the net zero goals, but what does that mean for you, your business, and your nation? Um, so if we kind of go on a similar circle as far as uh, exploring, what would you say from what you're experiencing at the moment, resilience looks like from a business resilience perspective? Yeah, so I'm going to start with something that we sort of discussed before. Um, I think we all heard about resilience in the past years as if uh, it was the only word that you could hear anywhere. Um, and um, at one point I got sick of it. So uh, I was like, so what is resilience actually? So uh, the dictionary, um, if, you, if you look at what resilience means from a physical, physics perspective, is the ability of an object or even a, a state to come back to its original state, so elasticity. Um, and I, I look at, it, at business resilience as not something that we need necessarily. I think what we need is the ability of businesses to transform constantly or to adapt. But even adaptation in itself is, is um, defensive. It's not really offensive. Uh, so we're not playing ahead. We're, you know, when you adapt, you adapt to change. You don't building change. You're not transforming. Uh, you're not, uh, you know, on top of the wave. You are not sinking, but you're not really going ahead. So that's why I, when I hear about business resilience, I try to um, you know, give it a look at it with a pinch of salt. Now, looking at it as without looking into the dictionary. I think it's the ability of businesses, or it should be, the ability of businesses not just to withstand uh, various types of shocks, but also to be able to prepare for the most probable shocks. Um, not just to, first, not just to um, go to net zero because uh, there's some form of regulation of the air, or because this, the stakeholders or the shareholders are doing this but because they believe that it will be a competitive advantage in the future. And third, um, businesses that are resilient are also businesses that are capable of um, being resilient, not just in one geography or in one um, context, but they, they have a muscle, if you like, to do that anywhere else uh, in the world. Uh, big, big businesses. If we're talking about a sock maker in Kathmandu, probably doesn't need to be very resilient and I don't. But that is where all the socks come from in North Scotland, to just say. So you know. I don't. <laughs> Captain do that is. Okay. Yes. Uh, I will also start uh, to to explain what is resilience for me, <laughs> what I'm understanding from business resilience. Actually, it's a capacity for me. Uh, capacity uh, to uh, the, the, the capacity of business uh, of uh, interconnected uh, pillars of like social, economic, and uh, ecological uh, abilities. And uh, it, I mean, it, I don't think uh, it's really offensive. Uh, maybe uh, my perspective is more biological or more ecological, I don't know. Uh, but uh, if you have this uh, capacity, I mean that inter interconnected capacity, so uh, the business uh, is able to, to withstand and recover from the extremities. Uh, I mean, not only weather extremities, uh, even the economical extremities, fluctuations, uh, technological transformation. So, uh, uh, if uh, if we talk about the business resilience, so if uh, the business has uh, the capacity uh, to adapt itself uh, to the new conditions, uh, that's resilience for me. Yeah, uh, it's a big surprise. I agree with both of you, but um, <coughs> don't. No, I won't. I won't. I'll, I'll, I'll try to disagree. Uh, to me, to me, it's not really one uh, definition. Uh, kind of uh, trying to sum up in one uh, very bad sentence. Kind of the ability to cope, and I'll explain what I mean. To cope with effectively whatever it is thrown at you. So I think you are completely right on. You know, it does include an element of understanding or seeing or trying to scenario out the future and kind of adapt to that in advance. Uh, it can also be, you know. Uh, new regulations coming online, the ability to kind of maneuver whatever is, is uh, thrown at you. 
Um, it's the ability to survive through different times, but not at all cost. I mean, when COVID hit, many of you and all of you were obviously exposed to that. You know, there are many businesses that are still around, but the way they were resilient was to basically furlough or fire everyone and just sit still for two years and now they're back. I don't know if that's resilience to me, and that's just survival. Um, but to me, it, it, it takes shapes and forms, but it's, it's really about being able to uh, maneuver, being able to adapt, and I think it includes what you said, and I think it includes what you said. So, building on your comments, not really disagreeing. And a, a great point there as far as the expectations when people discuss COVID, that it's all going to be negative. And I'm going to start the controversy by saying it was actually our best period for growth. Um, because given the fact that we look at resilience and leadership, it's when leaders really needed to stand up to the plate. And many of them had never experienced that form of scenario. Um, I spent 20 years in the army, so looking at biological and chemical warfare was not unusual for me. And all I just looked at was, this is just another serial. This is normal. So what I would also invite you to explore is resilience will probably be different for each one of us. Because to come through to the other side also includes understanding our own context, both culturally, um, commercially, and where we are geographically. And so, yes, practically, it may be that uh, you describe the physical, the physics piece. I guess one of the reasons why I wrestle with the idea that resilience is going back to your original form is just the word back is any idea, and people talk often about mental resilience, for example, and the idea that you can bounce back. Back to what? People talked post-COVID about, let's go back. Why on earth you just had an opportunity to create a new normal, to move forward? So part of this, I think, as we look at resilience, is we're also, uh, my invitation is to say, we're also looking at what does that future look like? Perfect for you both. And in which case, Resilience for me when I am looking at businesses is what is going to help you beat the next person and not in a negative way but so that your supply chain has got resilience in it. If something changes, do you have second, third order ability to be able to respond? When you're looking at talent pipeline, we'll hopefully get into a discussion about green talent. What are we doing as nations as well as businesses to upskill for the future requirements? I would give an example as far as Kenya, for example, has now put coding into its um, curriculum. And I know that the lady who went to pitch for that was actually a refugee who came to the UK. And uh, I've met through the World Economic Forum, funny enough. And she went to Boris Johnson and asked the same thing and said, for the future, what is going to happen for the UK? And our government said, sorry, that's all too difficult. We're not going to add it. She went back to her own nation where she'd been a refugee from, who went, brilliant idea. We have a rural population base. What will be the future of our work stream um, for Africa to be able to expand tech? And that's where they've moved to. So I think there's some real interesting parts here on when we look at resilience, it can be very holistic, both from a human perspective out, and then also the business uh, outwards from where are we here today? And uh, one of the gentlemen who was here earlier was from Nigeria, and bless him, he said, when I said, oh, my family has uh, spent a lot of time in Nigeria, and he said, oh, when was that? And I said, before independence, which basically is like pre-mid-1960s. So my father is 90, he's the youngest of seven, and so all of my upbringing when looking at business is looking at businesses over 100 years old. So often then, when we're looking at resilience and longevity, that's my invitation is, are you looking to grow something? For a short-term impact, fine, there's no judgment with that, but know that that's what you're aiming to do. If you're looking for something that's due to give, the net zero goals are in 2050. Where are each one of us going to be around this table in 2050? So are we mentally having that agility as well to look forward to what does resilience mean for your business, nation, or organization in a 25 to 30 year context? So we're setting those policies and styles now of evolution that we are looking as 2050 being today. I, I think we're also living in a, a, a new era of business mm -hmm. where a significant number of entrepreneurs, at least those that we work with in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, have one thing and one thing in their mind. It's a word from four letters and it's called exit. 
It is the exit regeneration of entrepreneurs, for which the purpose is not to build businesses necessarily, to build businesses that last forever, um, but to build more businesses because they are highly creative. Uh, first, they get bored quite easily. And third, um, it is less about building organizations and organizations for cultures and more about building products and services that, okay, might even fix a social issue or not, um, but that uh, actually uh, produce enough profit to help you get to your next uh, startup. So your 100 years company uh, point, um, I think, uh, has a huge impact on how net zero will actually look into the, in the future. Because we talk about 2040, 50, uh, not just we, but even in policy making, uh, either in Brussels or Washington, Pekin, uh, we talk about it very lightly because it's not really us that will deal with that, but other generations that will deal with 2050. Uh, and these generations, parts of them at least, uh, are already sustainable by nature, but they're not building necessarily uh, businesses that uh, will last long and will have a huge uh, footprint in the CO2. Uh, first. Second, um, my second point. Uh, is related to uh, what you mentioned about business resilience. Um, I, th I think something happened in COVID um, that made a large number of entrepreneurs rethink why they do what they do. Because they had more time at home, not necessarily time that they enjoyed. So there is not enough data on that, but at least in Europe or Western Europe where we have some data. Uh, we see that founders of, of companies, um, usually in their late 30s and mid 40s, probably because, or also because of COVID, they are now looking into a different organizational culture. That means less working hours, uh, less pressure on the team, because they felt the pressure on their own, they felt a different type of pressure. And that brings a new type of responsibility that some of them feel, most of them feel too, which is about creating businesses that not necessarily go to net zero, but are a bit more sustainable. So I think you're right, they, COVID also brought some, some very interesting positive uh, outlooks, especially in how some founders think about their role in, in the future. And if I can just, just before we carry on around, add to that, which is, is definitely an adage that I've been brought up with, which is, that the best businesses are created during a recession. And potentially is that also where, for the teams we worked with, I remember just very briefly on a COVID anecdote, was um, I look after an investment back, back in London, and I spoke to one of the partners, he said, oh, I can't wait, it's only gonna be six weeks, and I've got my trees to cut, I'm gonna play football with my kids, and I didn't know what to do as far as apart from love because I thought I can't, ch I can't be rude to this gentleman. He's a lovely human being. But I thought he has no concept of what's coming. And there's no judgment in that. That's why I have the role I have. But uh, we turned it around as far as for them to see it as an opportunity. And in this arena, hopefully, is when we are presented with something that looks unpleasant to other people, we'll have that strength to step forward and see it as an opportunity. And they all grew and had their best year ever during the 18 months of COVID, so the build-up, because we made sure it was high trust, high integrity, and supportive, so that you're not stuck at home feeling alone. And maybe that's another part of the resilience, is also actually coming back to us, starting with us, is how resilient do we feel? If you feel alone, you, you, you erode your ability to respond. And as businesses and business leaders, we need to be able to look after each other and respond. Sorry, but that was my, my COVID piece for um, see an opportunity whenever you see a problem. Um, yeah, it's not really about net zero, but net zero is what we work with, so it's, it's kind of related. But, but I, I both agree and I find and disagree uh, with, with a couple of points. Uh, and this is a real life story because it's about me. Um, so, yes, you know, we, have a, we have a team of back then when COVID hit, we were like 25 people. Um, and as you say, or I think it was a church or someone who said that a waste of good crisis, right? Yeah. Um, so what we did was actually a version of what you you just said, that you know we were extremely exposed to global aviation. 
that is not from on March 13, 2020. We're down like six percent, like overnight. Um, and then you know, every venture investor, every external person not being part of the team advised us and well meant advice was you know you, you guys you have to chase pizza apps and start you know offsetting last mile delivery all of this is booming you know we run the numbers um, and we found that you know even though aviation wasn't exactly booming and um, they were all basically bankrupt at that point in time our analysis was very basic like number one global travel is not dead it's it's uh, it went into hiatus but it's not dead and one of the first things people will want to do when you know <laughs> after these six weeks uh, is to start traveling again so we did the opposite of everyone else we actually went back to basics so your definition of resilience we kind of went a bit back to where we were we killed every project even though it was revenue generating that wasn't related to aviation because we knew how explosive that was from a revenue and impact perspective then number two we also, uh, this was a very gut feeling based analysis, but it was, there can't be anyone else being this stupid and start to chase airlines in the midst of a pandemic when every airline is grounded. So we started doing that. And what happened is once uh, the pandemic started to fade, you know, immediately all numbers went through the roof. People started traveling again, you know, we're all here. Um, so to us, that was kind of a real life experience on resilience. Uh, we were able to keep every single team member, not a single person quit, which is completely stupid. There were much better things to do during during COVID than work in an aviation exposed uh, company. But kind of putting that together, part culture uh, related to resilience, part stupidity and naivety as you need as a founder, being like overly optimistic, and as you say, kind of being able to call it back to where you were or being able to actually, you know, being hyper focused as well. So never waste a good crisis. Um, Brilliant. And Oscar? I was thinking of the story to tell, <laughs> to close the loop. Yes, I have a story too, but uh, it's not about COVID. Uh, actually, I would like to a little bit elaborate the interconnected uh, aspects uh, of the capacity for the residents and uh, how, how the business uh, can achieve uh, to be resilient. Uh, towards uh, 2050 and uh, you know mainly the, the, uh, the net zero or carbon neutral or whatever the goals for the uh, 2050 is mentioned with uh, mitigation actions and goals and there is another pillar uh, which is a little bit uh, underrated <laughs> and underestimated is adaptation and climate risks so uh, now is the time for story. <laughs> Actually, uh, this is uh, a fiction story made by me. Uh, I'm using uh, in my trainings. Uh, just uh, travel to the uh, to uh, time travel to the 2050, uh, first January in the morning. Okay. We just celebrated uh, New Year stuff, and uh, we are a bit dizzy. And uh, late morning, uh, we just uh, watching on TV and, okay, breaking news, we are uh, net zero. We achieved all the world, okay, uh, we succeeded uh, to be a net zero and, uh, you know, uh, we, we met the Paris Agreement goal, that's fine. And the next breaking news would be uh, will be about some extra extreme weather events uh, and uh, even uh, you know uh, more extreme like three four fold than now we experience and doesn't matter uh, you you know uh, just balance uh, your carbon emissions with the rules you are not resilient and uh, this is very important uh, because adaptation uh, is one of the key and uh, uh, would be the, um, the you know, um, uh, success of the resilience in the future. And uh, in the next round, <laughs> uh, I want to talk about more uh, on the role of the, the policies, government and international policies. Uh, I, I need to say something about the future. Um, the problem that uh, I haven't really talked about 
is that there's a lot of emphasis on net zero, uh, which in itself is a uh, steady state forward. Um, it doesn't really change that much. Because what it does, um, the problem that I have personally have with net zero is that uh, it also contains uh, offsetting. So what it means is that you still do what you do, but you pay some money through which somebody plants trees or whatever uh, does in the end. Um, so in the end, net zero or achieving net zero is not, it's, it's very important, but it will not fix the problem. It's like my, my favorite metaphor is you have a, uh, a flooded cellar, right? Uh, and it's full of water. Uh, so, so one solution is to close the tap. You can just close it. Is this a, a wise thing to do? Yes. Is this going to fix the problem? No. Because the water is still there. So what you need to do is to get the water out. What we need to do is, is net negative. What we need to do is to get the carbon out. Uh, say for, uh, there's a million ways to do that. Well, not to say there's five ways. But still, uh, the problem is that we need companies, perhaps, need to look into investing more into their net negative um, strategies, not just into their net uh, zero strategies, which themselves are not strategies, but PR stunts, mostly. Um, I'm currently doing an analysis with my colleagues on the promises, let's call it by, by, by top uh, 300 companies in the world, the companies that have uh, any type of uh, net zero uh, ambition, to see how much of that is science-based. Uh, and what we have uncovered so far, we've done about 120, 130 of these companies, is that less than 5% of these companies have actually done this, or have, or can prove, uh, or have a science-based approach where they say, by 2030, we go 100%, 87%. Most of these figures are random, or they're not based not just upon science, but in particular on capacity. So uh, one example, I'm not going to name the name of the company, uh, because we also work with them. <laughs> uh, it, it's, a, it's a big oil and gas company. So for oil and gas, aviation, whatever, there's industry cement. Net zero is very popular. But this company has put forward a very ambitious agenda for 2030, not to go to net zero, but to go close, and to become a circular business. Uh, instead of selling oil and gas, uh, becoming a petrochemical company. Um, and we looked at their, uh, we read everything they had, uh, and we found three major logical fallacies, which if anyone else reads them, they're there. So we asked them, what is this? Somebody eventually in private said, oh, but we didn't really, we don't really believe what we put there. We just put there because we have to. And I think that's valid. And then this is a very big company. And if this happens to a very big company, when I look at medium-sized companies, I don't really expect them. I just want a small point because if uh, a company claims that they are net zero, so offsetting is out of question. So uh, there shouldn't be any offset if you are saying that you are net zero. It's uh, it's not net zero. It's carbon neutral. Okay. So uh, there is a very big difference between carbon neutral and net zero. Uh, that's the point I really want to underline. And the another thing is about um, not offsetting, but the uh, other artificial technologies to remove the uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is like uh, carbon capture and storage and utilization. Uh, I just checked the numbers from the European Commission that uh, natural sinks uh, are removing every year uh, between 9 to 11 gigaton of uh, CO2. And there is no artificial carbon sink can remove uh, that much carbon from the atmosphere. So uh, we have to uh, change the technologies. We have to change the way uh, to, to uh, produce energy. And uh, we have to change the, the uh, living of life, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but uh, let's come back to the, the terminology. It's uh, mainly uh, misuse this net zero, carbon neutral, uh, even climate neutral. So. Thank 
it's it's and it's badly used in official documents by the large companies. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I just wanted to, to tell you about the, the new technology uh, that captures carbon dioxide amazingly at, at rates unseen so far by any technology. It's a tree. It's called a tree. Uh, it's very interesting device. Uh, and, and, and it also offers shade. That's what we are so, using. So nature-based solutions are something that um, um, some companies are looking into um, and to invest in. The problem with that is that uh, the, capital, the, the calculation of the ROI um, also needs to be changed. So um, other types of values besides monetary value needs to be in place. And there are you know, systems uh, within the sustainable finance world that do that. The problem is that um, even at large scale um, or forestation or reforestation projects, um, the investment uh, can take up to 20 to 25 years. Why? Because it's not enough to plant a tree, you need to take care of the tree. Until a tree becomes um, a, uh, a technology that <laughs> captures uh, CO2 and uh, emits oxygen, it's an amazing technology, you know, it's natural. Um, it takes a lot of time. So we need long-term investments into something that doesn't actually produce necessarily money. How do you change the philosophy of the sustainable of the finance world into a more sustainable finance, not just a classical lawyer? Yes, and now you're arguing against yourself because uh, you are oversimplifying the role of offsets. An offset is not an offset. You have extremely high integrity, high quality offsets. That you know, if you peel away the layers, you know the popular thing, and the media is presenting it now, is absurd. Uh, especially a certain UK-based newspaper are almost portraying offsets as the problem, not the emissions, which is absolutely absurd. The emissions, that's the problem, not the offsets. That's number one. Uh, number two, what offsets? And I underline when I say offsets, I mean the high integrity ones, not kind of you know 2007 bullshit offsets that uh, you can buy for 50 cents. That's not what I'm talking about. The high integrity offset, what is it really? It is climate financing. And it's mainly a flow of money from the Western Hemisphere to developing countries and to extremely important climate projects in you know, rural Africa, uh, in the Amazons, etc., etc., etc. A lot of nature-based offsets are doing exactly what you say. They are effectively putting a price on afforestation, reforestation, forest protection, and it's a crucial source of financing. It is an offset. It is a carbon credit. But the moment is actually flowing, and of course you have some bad players there as well, I'm very well aware. But if you really peel away the layers, and you have the control mechanisms, and you have the right calculations, and these are kind of human-made you know, uh, rules that you can improve, you can learn, you can do a mistake, and you can improve in order to you know, always um, raise the bar on what is kind of good enough or good integrity. But what you just described on this wonderful dimension uh, of the thing called the tree or algae or uh, mangroves, you know, where do, where do they get their money from now? It's actually carbon offsets. So trying to kill off carbon offsets, as certain newspapers are trying to do, is detrimental to a lot of forest based projects, for instance. I want to plan that. Uh, can I reply now or later? Yeah, and one more thing, you know, I, and I, mean, I, I, I love also the engineer, direct air capture projects, etc. But from a, uh, and I'm, I'm, yes, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not necessarily an advocate for everything. But there's also a problem in that, because now the flow of funds are actually going from, call it, the global west to, you know, in exclamation marks, the global south. Whereas I think 99.9% .9 of the direct air capture projects are funded by US, UK, Western European VCs or investors, it's in uh, the Western Europe or in the United States, and the money stays there. So you're not kind of contributing to the wider community, etc. that you do with, for instance, the forest projects in Africa. Uh, that point I can't make anymore, because you just made it. Okay. Uh, but the first one is, um, the problem is that some companies use the offsetting, which is doing an amazing job, of course, to not change how they operate. So when they do that, we're not just we're, we're you know we have the problem and the solution that go in parallel instead of just focusing on the solution. Of course, some of them cannot just stop what they're doing because some of us use planes to get here, right? Not a very very friendly uh, action for all of us. Yes. 
uh, but uh, train from Costco is complicated these days. Let's have to I'll be here in 25 minutes. Yeah. So um, that was my, my reaction, but can you take the moment? Actually, there is a remedy uh, for water. Same. I mean, uh, for the companies uh, just doing nothing and offsets uh, with credits, it's incentive, actually. So, uh, which is, uh, incentive is just, you know, uh, reduce the, the emissions uh, from your own supply chain. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, which is also, you know, you, you can cover the supply chain and uh, also the scope 3 emissions as well. And uh, you can, uh, you know, start to change or transformation from your company to do maybe an end user and during the supply chain. So uh, we should uh, consider incentive more. <laughs> so Oscar, uh, thank you for a new term. I didn't think we would have any more buzzword bingo <laughs> no. to be able to play. But so insetting is a new term for logic. It seems. Uh, last year uh, in uh, Egypt, in Sharm el Sheikh, uh, COP27, in business uh, sessions, uh, we uh, more talk about incentive actually. Fascinating. So, I guess from that aspect, one thing I would also really encourage is why aren't we looking at this holistically? So, so far, just in our very brief discussion now, we've had carbon neutral, carbon capture, net zero, net positive, net negative, circular economy ecological investments, carbon credits, carbon offsets, and carbon insetting. For anyone who's not deeply interested in this, which I would assume because we are here, we are, that's also very confusing for people to try to work out how to do the right thing. And uh, as you gathered, I loved kind of analogies. And my invitation to all of you is we had a talk this morning uh, where someone said, why are we still considering each other as continents? Why aren't we considering each other as a globe? And my invitation is to start looking at what you want to achieve holistically. So Oscar, you did a great piece of kind of vision, it, vision creation. And very rarely do we have people clearly delineate for us a vision of what good looks like. We spend so much time looking at what terrible is that we forget to actually start to put color and imagination into what a great planet looks like that we are still living in, in 2050. And as an example of the carbon capture we were discussing is uh, my family lives up in the highlands of Scotland and where they have put the wind turbines, they have had to dig up peat bogs. Peat bogs are one of the best ways to retain carbon. So nobody has looked at the release of the carbon to put in the wind turbine with the, at that stage, turbines that were unrecyclable, now luckily that has moved ahead, but so you were creating a problem at the same time as trying to solve. So we definitely don't want to get into the position where we don't try and solve, but it's looking at things holistically, trying to be approaching what is the outcome we want. And we've definitely been, I think, maybe all guilty of thinking everything happens over here in comparison to what's happening here. Um, and with the, um, the, the carbon offset piece, with, for example, I, for my own travel, I've tried to ask, what is my emissions? It's really hard. You mentioned about the summit you've just run, where there was a company that then showed you all the different emission variants. It's, it's often far more complex but simple in its own weird way. Once you have someone who knows how to find it to show us, but we don't think about it in a holistic manner. Um, so if we come now back round to this piece of sustainable business, you need a sustainable supply chain. What does that look like? You need a talent base. What does that look like? We need to be able to have environments where why are we building on floodplains? Where we're creating problems. So one of the big discussions I've uh, been involved in in London is actually, do we have climate crisis or do we have human-made crisis? You know, we build on floodplains and then we're surprised when we're flooded. You build again where there have been hurricanes. The hurricane belts are not new. And so my question to all of us too is, 
how much when we're looking at the short-term ROI are we forgetting about what time the lo what the long-term financial as well as environmental impact will be? Because if you want an exit, you still need to exit to somebody, which involves selling to a business that may well want M and A as their growth, and then you need to have your factors in that you'll still survive. Uh, so, sorry to complete what you just said about offsetting. Uh, so we have this event called climate change summit that I mentioned before. And last year and this year, of course, well, we did an offsetting uh, of it. Uh, the, the money that we put into the credit that we bought was actually lower than the fee that the company that made the calculation. <laughs> so uh, that was also funny, but eventually they said they would do it for free. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it's, it's also funny uh, sometimes. Um, and then uh, uh, two things. The first is uh, I, I can also put on the table a word inside. Uh, which you might know, which is digital. Digital. Uh, yeah, digital. So digital is, is the new reality, which is both physical and digital. Sometimes. Digital. But besides that, that's not what I wanted to talk about. It's the sustainable uh, supply chain um, and, and how this looks and will look in Europe and what is the impact of the new uh, sustainability regulations uh, in the EU. So we have a corporate sustainability uh, reporting directive, CSRD, which uh, for those of us that live in Europe, or especially for those of us, not me, that are working in accountancy, is a mess. Everybody hates it, but everybody loves it as well, because finally we got the point. Uh, and what it says, in short, is that companies um, of a certain type, but soon enough all companies in Europe, and not just European companies, but also companies that sell in Europe, with uh, 150 million uh, per year revenue uh, in, in Europe um, and need to report significantly more and in more detail and even uh, related to their, the, to their supply chain. So what that means is that regulation will actually force again in Europe companies to become more sustainable. I'm not sure if they become more green or greener uh, because uh, as, as the new um, uh, color mechanism works. Uh, if you put a bit of brown with a bit of brown, you might get a bit of green. Uh, so there's shades of green yeah, as well. Uh, but at the same time, we will see uh, a tormented uh, SME sector in Europe that needs to do things that is unequipped to do, which is to measure their outputs and inputs, obviously. Um, and to put it in a uh, accounting uh, form that they are not used to, first of all, and second of all, that is expensive. It's a new cost, uh, and there's, uh, well, where will the cost go to? To the consumer, as well. So um, I think this is a great idea in Europe, at least, the EU directives, also the Greenwashing Directive, but in the same time, which if it passes, but in the same time, it will create not just a, a cost for the consumers and the companies, SMEs in particular, but also large companies, maybe. but it will also or might lead to some form of competitive issues for some European companies uh, in the future. And if I can just add a piece on that, as far as we've been trying to find an offset version, because ironically I wanted to plant trees at home and couldn't get the stats to find out how many trees I need to plant, because just for any of you that haven't studied agriculture, um, obviously each different variety of tree takes a different period of time to mature, and therefore it will take a um, specific amount of time before it will actually sequester, which means retain and absorb more carbon than it is used to grow it and for it to be alive. So roughly speaking, from an Amazonian perspective, we're looking at about 20 years before the energy used to grow that tree will be more, uh, sorry, will be less than the carbon that it's sequestering. So if you want to be planting trees now for you to be able to carry on breathing, then don't expect it to make any difference for about 20 years. But we're also looking, and that's not in a bad way, it's like, it's, it's worth starting now, I guess is my takeaway from that, is don't put it off because it needs to go in the ground today. But also is that actually, from that perspective, we're often putting the idea of carbon sequestration, for example, into different parts of the planet 
from where we are causing the issues. So it's also exploring what can you do closer to home. So we've had certain parts of London, for example, that have now got um, food being grown in the tunnels underneath the city. Um, I'm a mentor for a company called, uh, well it's not a company, it's an organisation called Unreasonable, that essentially is all the most unreasonable um, ideas, so things like invasive species, turning those into sushi, being able to encourage carbon, um, uh, mention it, put the sea. Algae. The algae and the man mangroves. So it's really being looking at what can you have locally. If you're, you know, I've just been up in the boreal forests up in the north of Norway where they left the lights on all night. I was like, this is so simple. Stop trying to put in more energy creation. Just stop using what you've already got. Um, and it was really interesting how much pushback I got on that. And this piece that um, was in the last discussion, Ben, I think you mentioned about look at what we can do locally and just look at what you can do at home. And then when we're looking at that carbon offset, the carbon um, credits, I think, so will you be a good person, Andreas, to talk about carbon credits? Because there's also a piece which, just for my own personal part, I rail against, is the idea that somebody's going to cost you more in the human processing of what our carbon emission has been in comparison to what we're investing back into the system to get it sorted. So there are, don't give up, I guess is my piece for this little part, is find a mechanism that fits for you. So we found charities that will therefore you'll be getting it as tax deductible that enable you to do the, hundred, you know, the, the due diligence. But that doesn't fit for everyone if you're a much bigger business. So maybe this would be an opportunity to talk about carbon credits because that is an entire new market where people are then selling the carbon credit from one person to another. It is not the same as offsetting, it's very different. So maybe leave you guys to have an explore of that. Yeah, so the carbon credit is kind of the asset as such, an offset uh, is kind of balancing out uh, an emission somewhere else. Uh, the way a carbon credit turns into offset is when you take it out of the circulation and you retire it. Um, so, so that's kind of one part. I, I also, on that note, and uh, a previous point that was made, um, and I think, I think we all agree on the following, that you know, corporations that actively do not change just by offsets uh, and say we're neutral, that's complete bullshit, pardon my language. Um, that won't be allowed in Europe either uh, in a couple of years. I mean, with new directives, etc., you have to be like super transparent. And kind of back to that resilience point, I think maybe trying to have a crystal ball and, and look into the future, being able to be brutally transparent. You know, maybe you have a 2030 goal or 2015 and worse. I mean, uh, focusing on effectively just delaying anything that, that kind of hindrances your day-to-day -day business. Uh, but the second you introduce kind of real, actual transparency, for me, being able to see, you know, what do you do at your event? How are you going to reach, you know, next year's target, whatever. And I can kind of test that. I can test that against my model so I can understand that. Maybe I'll call them and give you some, you know, some advice or the other way around. But the second you, you know, put those in the drawer and you're not publicly available, you're not able to, you know, respond to a journalist, you're not able to respond to an academic, that's when it's getting, you know, to me, borderline uh, bullshit or more marketing. Uh, you have always some who does this and some who, and I disagree with you, who use offsets as almost like a voluntary carbon tax. It's not instead of it's in addition to. And I think that's one of the main problems in all discussions on climate, all discussions on net zero, all discussions on climate neutral, it always ends up as a black and white discussion. It's yes or no to offsets, it's yes or no to this, it's yes or no to that. That's not the thing. To me, it's always, you know, it's a yes and. You know, if you are an airline, if you are a shipping company, the best thing you can do from a climate perspective is to shut down your business, which is not kind of, it, and, and it is, uh, but that's kind of, a bit rough to sell to your shareholders or stakeholders or passengers, a bit rough, I'd say. Um, but that, that, that would be the ideal situation, you know, just turn off whatever you do, that's the best. Uh, in setting, I completely agree. Um, you can replace, for instance, jet fuel with uh, biofuels, etc, etc, etc. But having offsets as one part of it, I strongly, uh, kind of, I'm an advocate for that. Because, say you're an airline, 
um, you can do maybe a 5% change by investing in new planes. Maybe you can do you know, X percent by only using one engine when taxing. You know, all these small things that you, that you can do in kind of everyday operations. But just saying, let's wait until maybe hydrogen. Let's wait until maybe batteries. Let's wait until maybe you know, whatever comes next. That's a 2050, 2060 thing. Until that, to me, it's better to do something. It's not perfect. It doesn't reduce my emissions flying from Oslo to here, but at least I'm addressing it. I impose a voluntary carbon tax on myself, which to me is better than pretending and sit here and talk about the problem, but really not doing anything. Yes. Uh, first, uh, there is no one type of carbon credit. We cannot talk about a carbon credit as the one thing because uh, mainly uh, you mentioned uh, uh, your uh, speeches about voluntary carbon uh, part and uh, there is uh, mandatory schemes like EU ETS and some other mandatory schemes uh, over the uh, globe and there is a new mechanisms uh, allow the countries to sell their uh, transferable mitigation actions under the uh, Article 6 of Paris Agreement. So, uh, even country level, you can offset uh, your emissions uh, with the, the some others removed. Uh, so, uh, there is a big world uh, for carbon. Uh, my first um, climate conference at Bali 2007, uh, we were talking about uh, if it's possible to uh, have a one uh, carbon price over the globe. So we see it's not possible, <laughs> actually. Uh, and uh, there is many problems, ma many bottlenecks experience over the years, like additionality. I'm sure uh, uh, you have uh, much deeper uh, knowledge about that. Uh, so the, the carbon, carbon market is uh, not a one thing, actually. Uh, and uh, one part is uh, regulated uh, in some countries uh, by the governments and in my opinion should be regulated by the governments uh, with the cap and trade systems. Uh, I mean, uh, there is a limit uh, for uh, certain uh, industries uh, and uh, if you are above uh, the limit, you can sell uh, to the ones they are uh, below the limit. Uh, this is the, the basic uh, uh, uh, working technique of uh, cap and trade system. So uh, we will see uh, it's good to put a price on carbon uh, as a commodity, <laughs> uh, but uh, this much complicated issue uh, uh, to discuss. And uh, actually, I would also add uh, to uh, uh, my colleague's uh, point about uh, the, the policies and the role of policies in uh, the, the future resilience of business. I think that the climate policy is already uh, part of uh, the trade and uh, part of the competition. Uh, and this is already a new normal uh, for the business. So this is another uh, uh, pillar uh, to, to build a capacity to be resilient. Brilliant. And um, Dr. Dr. Exke, I'm so sorry, we, you've come and joined us a little bit late, so apologies that we haven't included you earlier on the discussion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Would you like to give us your viewpoint on business resilience and where that fits with uh, developing uh, ways forward towards reaching net zero? Yes. Uh, welcome to the Atlantic. Uh, welcome to Tupi. My name is uh, Ibrahim Amnikshi. I am from uh, the Atlantic. I'm Nini Gazantep and I'm studying in finance and, uh, and I'm working at Gazantep University as a professor and I'm studying and work uh, finance. Uh, if possible, uh, with your permissions, uh, I want to speak as the Yeah, of course. Uh, and uh, I have uh, papers uh, about uh, climate finance and you can see that's my story. Küresel ısınma değerli katılımcılar ve beraberinde gelen iklim değişiklikleri iklim finansmanı kavramını malumunuz ortaya çıkarmıştır. İklim finansmanı kabaca yeşil yatırımların veya daha az karbon yayan yatırımların 
e, yatırımlar için gereken finansmandır malumunuz. E, IMF raporlarına göre 2050 net sıfır emisyon hedefleri için küresel iklim yatırımlarının yaklaşık e, 5 trilyon dolar olacağı tahmin edilmektedir ve bunların ve bu kısmın 2 trilyon doları e, yükselen piyasalar ve gelişmekte olan ekonomiler için söz konusu, ol, söz konusu olacağı tahmin ediliyor. E, malumunuz yükselen ekonomiler ve e, gelişmekte olan ülkelerdeki finansman sorunu e, bunun önündeki, iklim finansmanının önündeki en büyük engel. E, Türkiye gibi gelişmekte olan ülkelerde e, finansman sorunu, firmaların finansman sorunu ne yazık ki e, hat safhada. Bu iklim finansmanının e, veya iklim değişikliğinin bana göre önemli boyutu. Finans çalışan birisi olarak konuşuyorum. E, iklim değişikliğinin finansmanı veya iklim finansmanı bana göre firmaların önündeki en büyük sorun. Her ne kadar olayın pazarlama, yönetim boyutu olsa da bir finans çalışan, bir finansçı olarak konuşuyorum. Ee, en önemli sorunlardan bir tanesi de finanstır. İklim finansma, iklim değişikliği gibi. Şu anda malumunuz e, iklim finansmanı için gereken birkaç tane kaynak var. Birincisi bankalar ve diğer finansal kuruluşlar. For example, basic. Yani e, Ant banka kredileri. İkincisi yeşil sermaye piyasası araçları, green bond dediğimiz yeşil sermaye piyasası araçları. İşte Türkiye olarak yaklaşık 10 yıldan beri e, firmalarımız, özellikle finans sektöründeki firmalarımız yeşil e, tahmin, green bond e, ihraç ediyorlar. Üçüncüsü kamu kaynaklı krediler ve hibeler. İşte tam bu noktada zaten Türkiye gibi ülkelerde sorun yaşanıyor. Dördüncüsü e, AB fonları ve beşincisi de Avrupa İmar ve Kalkınma Bankası gibi uluslararası kalkınma kuruluşları. Toplamda şimdilik beş adet iklim finansmanı için firmaların yararlanabileceği kaynak var. Bunlar dışında biliyorsunuz devletler düzeyinde karbon fiyatlaması ve emisyon ticareti konuları da gündemde. Bunun dışında, bu beş kaynağın dışında olaya İslami açıdan veya İslami finance açısından bakacak olursak sukuk, sürdürülebilir sukuk dediğimiz sukuk ihraçları söz konusu. Her ne kadar çok yaygınlaşmasa da sürdürülebilir sukuk da yine başka bir finansman kaynağı olarak karşımıza çıkıyor. Ee, i̇şte yeşil finans, az önce bahsettiğim gibi veya green bond dediğimiz kavram ee, yaklaşık 2007 yılında e, yanlış hatırlamıyorsam ortaya çıktı. İlk olarak Avrupa Yatırım Bankası bunu ihraç etti ve şu ana kadar 2 trilyon doların üstünde Green Bond ihraç edildi. Yeşil finans, yeşil tahrim ihraç edildi. Ee, şimdi burada ortaya çıkan temel faktör firmaların bu e, yeşil finans için veya iklim değişikliği için gereken kaynakları nereden bulacaklar? Zaten e, dünyada malumunuz faiz onlarının, interest rate'in bir artışı söz konusu. Yani bu ortamda e, finans kaynaklarının maliyeti yüksekken bu gereken finansı nereden bulacağız? Bana göre tartışılması gereken firmalar bazında, firmalar tarafında tartışılması gereken en önemli soru bu. E, bu vesileyle tekrar hoş geldiniz diyor. Teşekkürlerimi sunuyorum. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, so, for those who had the headsets, or did everyone have a headset that worked? Um, essentially, a key part of the discussion was about being able to finance and green finance. And one of the areas which I think is we're exploring this um, uh, nexus between resilience and investment and that zero is we risk compartmentalizing. And if you were going to be investing in a future business, you would want it to be able to sustain in the variances that we're going to see climatically and fiscally. And the movement of 
uh, of our population bases. So what I think will be really interesting too is over time, when it's not only nice to have that these are considered green, we discussed the brown and the green washing, but it's actually that money comes to a business because it's a strong business model. And as a strong business model, it should therefore be a environmentally sound um, to ensure that we are building in locations that are appropriate, that we're setting up solutions that are appropriate. Um, but totally appreciate that at the moment, often green solutions, be that for energy or climate tech, can be expensive because they're cutting edge. So I guess one of the questions to you all as a panel is, what do you see at the moment are opportunities for us to move a step forward in each of our different countries and arenas where there is already funding available and where it's already good business to do so, to move forward and be more climatically um, engaged? Actually, I'm not a finance person, so <laughs> my view is not really about finance, but you know, uh, we are hearing reading that uh, some billion dollar needed is needed for uh, to to be carbon neutral or just to to meet the goals of 2050 and something. I don't think any governmental, non-governmental, international funding can cover the need of finance, uh, the all need of finance. I think we should uh, see that the finance as a leverage, I mean leverage uh, for the transformation. We cannot cover all, all needs of finance. This is just a leverage and uh, if, I mean, uh, business uh, really wants to be a resilient, uh, I mean they can use this leverage uh, very intelligently and uh, I think uh, there is no no no source uh, to cover all the need of finance. Um, I completely disagree because I'm very optimistic. <laughs> now that we have a gap of about 33 trillion uh, to cover the SDGs and so on, whatever you want. Uh, in the same time, the sustainable sustainable uh, investment based assets are roughly going to, to 50 billion anytime soon. Uh, so there's money in the market. Second, uh, it depends what you do with the money, of course. But I want to come back to what the gentleman uh, said. Um, and how do companies, where do you get the money to either go climate neutral, net zero, plus one, or all the buzzwords, right? Like AI, resilience, we have all the words, right? Uh, so what happens is that I think we are uh, in a very good place in Europe, um, maybe even better in the States, but looking at Europe uh, from this perspective, there is significant amounts of money uh, that companies can get, not easy, but there is money there, either through the national uh, resilience and uh, recovery plans. Um, Romania has about 35 billion euro for the next years, for the next three years, two and a half years, out of which a significant amount is related to environment, uh, and this is led to from Spain all the way to Italy and, and other countries. Second, uh, the EIB, so the European Investment Bank, but also um, other uh, European financial entities or is it international financial entities like the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, uh, have significant amounts of money that they're ready to put in for this, let's call it, green transformation. I don't know, there's another buzzword. Let's use that. <laughs> that is because Turkey is not in the. No, no, uh, not Turkey. Okay. Even uh, the whole country is under the UN Turkey. Uh, at least in yeah, Romania, we're yeah. very happy to see that money functioning, and yeah. also, also in the Moldova or Moldova or, or Bulgaria. But uh, there is one thing where the money is um, and is not really being used that much, which is the banking system, uh, which works acceptable. Let's say in Europe, for example, in Romania, i uh, just give you one example. This is the third bank, so this is not the biggest bank. Uh, it's uh, the Societe Generale uh, branch in Romania, which has 
by 2025 1 billion euro to invest, or better said, to give loans uh, in sustainable investment or sustainable finance. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will go over the 1 billion because it's almost 950 million, so like two years to go. Um, this is about 15 to 16 of their overall portfolio. Uh, and there's other banks in Romania, and I know other cases in Bulgaria um, and Croatia, um, where banks go from 10 to even 22% of their entire portfolio. That is usually green money, so it's not uh, that much used for uh, social issues, for example, or other types of, uh, of, uh, of loans. Um, they're green, but there is money on the market, and um, it's not very expensive. And the banks need to do it, or want to do it. I'm never sure if they want to do it or they need to do it. Um, so I think this will happen more and more uh, in more countries, not just in, in Europe, but also in Latin America. Plus, there's other um, uh, types of, of money for the SME sector. The big companies have a way of dealing which is sometimes a bit easier. But the SME sector, <coughs> and I'm not talking about the small and micro, but more of the medium, so, so 10, 20, 30 million euro revenue, um, there's more and more financial opportunities for them. And I think this will grow in the future, also because they become more financially educated. And they understand that you don't just, you can take money to become sustainable in many forms, financial instruments, but also for many or for other types of um, interventions within your company. Because in the past years, more entrepreneurs become more climate literate uh, or green literate, whatever other buzzword you can use. So I, I, I'm hopeful uh, to come back to, to what you said, to what you asked. But in the same time, I'm also very cautious because it's very high, it's very silent space. Uh, and the more uh, at international level, the more um, um, geopolitical challenges and trade wars we have, the more it's going to be complicated to look at it holistically, not just in geography or, or NAFTA, EU. Or And you also get stuck on size. So like you said, small, medium enterprise being 5, 10, and 20 mil, and those at the bottom who are wanting to be grassroots change makers get stuck trying to create change with no access to relative funding. And I've been with microfunding. So the seed funding can often be very hard. So again, the invitation to all of you as listeners is ask. Every single sort of human being that you are interacting with, who is selling you your vegetables, who is selling you your engine, your your electricity, who is selling you your home, who's taking you on holiday, which airline are you getting on? So that we were talking earlier about risk versus reward. Make it rewarding for those who are making the effort, because otherwise, if there's no risk, why would somebody bother unless they are emotionally engaged and want to do the right thing? But if there is no risk, why would somebody bother having to pay an extra amount or give funding to where people are wanting to do the right thing, but the return, fiscal return on investment may not be obvious? And one of the other parts I would just suggest is, where would you sit on having your business hacked, having a cyber attack? Reputational risk now from a cyber attack is a zero-sum game. It should never happen. It is not acceptable. The banks have to pay you back if your money is taken. In time, we will hopefully get there with the same with uh, environmental impact and social impact of businesses. But when I, I come from a cybersecurity background, when they were first having to, big banks, businesses, etc., were having to pay for cybersecurity, we don't have the resource. You speak to the chief scientific officer or the chief information officer, there's no budget for that. You just wait until there's a few top headlines. The same in the financial sector with know your client. So know your client used to be just a one-way street of money out until you started seeing big fines to the audit companies, for example. So now I do a lot of KYC with the um, money laundering community, ironically, because I happen to work in wildlife quite a lot, hence the tree knowledge. 
um, and that is where large companies have been found to be moving illegal wildlife products and that has now been seen the same as cocaine and humans and um, weaponry because it's one of the top five international crimes. So when you were saying about legislation, when legislation starts, starts to catch up, that can be a positive in many ways, of which one of them, hopefully within the legal system, is ensuring that if somebody isn't playing ball, then they pay for it. Um, but if for us, if we're small business owners or running organizations or in government, nobody holds us accountable at the moment, arguably. So one for you guys also just to discuss your thoughts on accountability and how do we move our nations towards actively thinking they can have net zero? Yeah, I think the yeah, simplified version of what you're saying is effectively how do you make or call it net zero or, or, or similar, um, how do you make that the license to operate? Uh, you know, if, if you're an airline and you don't take safety seriously, you lose your license to operate, you can't fly. If you're an offshore oil company and you don't take health and safety seriously, you're not able to drill. Um, so I'm translating that into basically any type of maybe primarily consumer facing businesses, but also, also B2B businesses. How do you make that the license to operate? If you're not acting accordingly to you know, X, Y, and C within a climate and environment, nobody's going to buy from you. We're not there yet. Um, but going back to, back to hope that was discussed this morning, I think you attended that session. Um, I do have a hope that you know, my kids, they're, they're uh, 4, 7, and 10. I think their mindset will be different than mine. I'm 41, and I can already sense a very big kind of different mindset, only those, you know, even those that are 10 years younger than me. They look at the world different than I did. It's different growing up now than it was in the 80s. So that gives me some hope that, you know, whether legislation, I'm not enough enough to go into that and kind of get the perspectives of, of uh, all the people in the room as well. Um, but that, that, that consumer pressure, which effectively turns into a license to operate, that's kind of my biggest hope on, on kind of the topic of, uh, of today. Again, I uh, mentioned about adaptation and finance uh, in relation with uh, accountability uh, because uh, the projects uh, or uh, the new technology uh, you are going to, you are planning to apply and the whole, whole planning should be accountable uh, to, to use the finance more efficiently first. This is my point. And then another thing uh, for the business itself is if you are not measured, you don't know what uh, you are dealing with. And if you don't know, you cannot ma manage uh, your system. So uh, whether uh, you have carbon neutral, climate positive, uh, whatever target you have, uh, you should uh, go with the measurement and monitoring approach uh, to be accountable uh, for finance, uh, for your business sustainability, uh, and uh, for the future goals. <coughs> uh, th this is uh, this is the most important part of accountability for me. And uh, what else? Uh, and uh, the, the transparency and accountability <coughs> are. Uh, sometimes using each other, so this is another, uh, you know, uh, point of discussion. Uh, also in relation with the green washing as well, with that transparency issue. But maybe next one. Yeah, I should comment on that. And, uh, I'm very hopeful that the new, the future, is not yet the right function. Right? The green washing uh, director of the European Union. Well, uh, let us actually buy products that are green because they're green, not because somebody from the PR department or advertising company said it's green. Um, I had a question to, to you. I heard the term Islamic finance, uh, and I was curious to, to understand more about that. Uh, <coughs> İklim finansmanı konusunda e, klasik veya konvansiyonel e, fırsatların dışında veya finansmanların dışında e, sukuk dediğimiz e, İslami bankacılık temelli e, sekülü de var. 
menkul kıymetler var. Dolayısıyla e, özellikle İslam yani İslam ülkelerinin diyelim e, yararlanabileceği e, kaynaklardan bir tanesi. Her ne kadar e, sukuk sadece İslam ülkelerinde değilse başka ülkelerde de ihraç edilebilse de e, sürdürülebilir sukuk e, bana göre son yılda önemli bir gelişmesi. Bu konuda yapılan akademik çalışmalar da var. Sastelebilir sukuk e, adı altında. E, you can see e, academic papers e, bakabilirsiniz yani onlara. Hocam sukukun açılımı nedir acaba? Sukuk İslami finans dedik hocam. İsla, e, yani e, İslami tahmin diye geçiyor. Şey yok yok sukuk e, Arabic terms. Ha, e, yes, Arabic terms. E, Evet, son yıllarda sürdürülebilir sukuk, sustainability sukuk kavramı gelişti. Son birkaç yılda gelişen bir kavram. İşte İslami duyarlılığı olan kişilerin, ülkelerin kullanabileceği bir enstrüman. Bir financial enstrüman. Bir sukuk. Yani bu konuda yeni bir gelişme olduğu için belirtmek istedim. Teşekkür ederim. Peki. Bazen So I guess one of the interesting parts with um, with regulation and choice is hopefully as Gazantep receives money to help rebuild, is that the options for sustainable rebuild, rebuilding will be given preference. Because that's another part of exploring. I've been helping some of the EBRD um, applications and is helping as investors make sure that they are choosing if you have several choices of who do you have as a person who's going to rebuild to put in new agricultural systems is that they are looking to be as sustainable for the future as possible and i guess one of the parts i would definitely encourage for this part of the world aware that we come from different nations is don't always think that tech's going to be the solution sometimes the best solutions were created two million years ago or you know, several thousand years ago, I've worked in Afghanistan, and the water systems there are phenomenal. Um, you know, you have some really amazing long-term knowledge within the peoples of each land, and it's also taking time as we look for what will work longer term. Is sometimes look back and use hindsight to create that foresight. Um, and I hope that as you rebuild, is that some that you will integrate both new ways of working and historically well-known ways of working as well. Um, you, you mentioned, and maybe, I don't know if we have time or not, or anyone is interested in the topic of, of skills. Um, one thing that, at least in, in Central and Eastern Europe, where we operate mostly, um, is we see when we talk to SMEs, but also large corporates, uh, and we go through some of the challenges that they have related to this uh, sustainability transition. The second, usually, after capital, <laughs> is people. Um, and it's not just, I mean, of course, Europe has a tremendous, complicated demographic challenge, but uh, nevertheless, when it comes to skills for this green economy, Europe, uh, although it's very, it's very ambitious, uh, it's, it's also very uh, backwards. So we are uh, in a very bad place at this point. Um, and and um, data, for example, from the European Vocational Agency, agency Vocational Education Agency, um, shows that with some exceptions, most European countries uh, in, by 2030 will not have had enough uh, skills, uh, skilled uh, individuals in the green economy. So we're talking about waste management, we're talking about um, renewable energy, we're talking about diversity, etc. I'm not going to go into them. There's quite a lot of them, and it's not just about the environment. It's, it's uh, I think it's wrongly put green skills gap. I think it's sustainability skills gap. Um, but it's mainly, of course, about, about uh, green. Uh, and the second point on this uh, green skills gap, skills gap um, is that uh, the other continents are not doing well either. So it's not a European problem. We can't really import anyone uh, as we would like to um, and the question is we all want this new uh, green revolution but there is no revolution we're, you know, not that many of us uh, and 
in practice, how this works is that we need to invest more in technologies that replace uh, the missing uh, people or the missing activities that these people have. Uh, uh, and there are some use cases uh, for, for, for this to work, but it's still a, a long shot. We do not have enough time to create or to reskill people or to upskill if in the case. So the question is that I ask myself, uh, what are the technologies that we, can, we need to implement in the next five to seven years until we actually get the right people that would do that eventually? Because we don't have enough time to just wait to get skilled people. We need to do something in between. So what are the technologies that replace what we don't have in terms of So could you just explain what are the skills you're looking for? So for somebody who's not indoctrinated into this skills gap. Yeah. So for example let's take a um, retail company or another uh, uh, mining company. No, retail, mining is better. You know, you know. Uh, we've all drunk out of plastic water bottles since we've been here, and we're also all having glass of which everything has had to be mined. So if yeah. anybody is drinking from anything here, it's we're all responsible. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a, a regional company that wants to become more sustainable uh, would need someone that has the experience and the knowledge, either internally or through a consultant, that could help them with their waste management process, or somebody that could help them with their diversity uh, policies somebody that can help them uh, attract better and, and uh, easier to get the finance and take the sustainable finance. So that's why I say it's, a, it's not just a green skills gap, it's a sustainable sustainability or green uh, skills gap. So I think what's interesting here is is it a skill gap or is it a mindset gap? No, it's a skill gap. It's not about mindset. It's about knowledge. Um, it's, about, it's not about being uh, uh, uh, having a different mindset. It's about having a different type or more um, competencies, let's call it, yeah. maybe it's not skills, uh, but skills is so yeah, yeah. overused, right? Um, uh, and we see this even in um, our, the former employer, of uh, Fran, um, the latest feature of the world report in January, uh, showed the number one, the, the number two most desired and needed job in the world is a sustainability specialist. So there is a huge need and a huge gap, and we need to fix it ASAP. But if we can't fix it, what technologies can we use until we fix it? And if not, somebody will pay them. Yes. Maybe I will. Uh, there will be a skill gap for sure, but uh, we should achieve this transformation with no one left behind, as you said. So, uh, there will be some others losing their jobs, and we will uh, need some other uh, person, people with some new skills. So, uh, and I just search for uh, the term of just transition, and I uh, just find out that uh, this uh, terminology uh, first used in the uh, United States in the 80s, actually. Uh, by the trade unions, uh, they just uh, defend the workers uh, by the change of technology. So uh, this transformation shouldn't be seen only as a constraint on the yeah, it's it's a change, but uh, I just again uh, uh, want to underline it: we shouldn't left no one behind. We should. Uh, transform uh, the existing generations and next generations. Uh, if you don't mind me, then it's surprising how many people all of a sudden are climate experts and sustainability experts, but that's not the skills we're talking about. Uh, I mean, uh, as a former oil lawyer, it's an absurd amount of my ex-oil colleagues who are now sustainability lawyers, which is absurd. But that's not real skills nor uh, competence. And what, what do you see here in Gaznik as sure. the um, as the skill gap that will stop that is holding back Gaznik from regenerating in a sustainable and resilient manner for the future? Is there a skill gap here? Uh, yeah, thank you. Malumuz Gaznik'te büyük bir şeydir. 
e, ve yaklaşık bir adet e, orta ve büyük ölçek, ölçekli firma var. Ve bu firmaların, e, yine söylüyorum, bir finansçı olarak olaya bakıyorum. E, bu firmaların en büyük problemlerinden bir tanesi finansman. E, diyeceksiniz, pazarlama sorunları yok. Pazarlama sorunları elbette var. Efendim, yönetim sorunları elbette var. Ancak gelin görün ki, Türkiye gibi gelişme aktuar ülkelerde en büyük problem finans. Ee, ve bu konuda belki diğer bir faktör, işte tartıştığımız üzere e, anlayış. Yani özellikle e, üst yönetimin e, anlayışı. Bu konuya öncülük etmesi gerekiyor. Eğer üst yönetim, e, firma yöneticileri bu konuya öncülük ederlerse, bu konuda yeni arayışları, yeni finansman tekniklerini efendim öne alırlarsa o zaman bu işin daha da kolaylaşacağına inanıyorum. Bir de burada devletin e, öncülük etmesi gerekiyor. Devletin e, bu firmalara kolaylık sağlaması gerekiyor. Özellikle az önce e, bir Sanesko bahsetti. E, finansal okul yazarlık, yöneticilerin finansal okul yazarlığının geliştirilmesi anlamında e, bu konu önemli. E, eğer e, yöneticilerin finansal anlayışları, finansal okul yazarları gelişirse e, bu konunun daha da kolaylaşacağına inanıyorum. Çünkü e, konu, konu yeni, e, rakamlar büyük, hal böyle olunca hem anlayış, hem destek, e, hem de uygulama ön plana çıkıyor. Ben böyle düşünüyorum. Teşekkür ederim. So potentially, if one of the areas is financial acumen, then it's also people who can provide good modeling to demonstrate why investing into sustainable and resilient options is more fiscally viable long term than the short term quick win of here's something cheap versus here's something that's going to last 10 years rather than 10 months. So we need good financial modelers. And uh, and on that happy note, that is exactly what I currently do in London, is every time somebody wants to put in a more resilient and sustainable option, we get them to model it, to financially demonstrate why it's more resilient for the business and more financially viable longer term, as in three, four, five, six, seven, eight years out, than short term. So it demonstrates why a short term hit financially is worth long term gain. So, aware that we're standing between uh, you and dinner, is, um, could we have, please, any questions, sorry to be rather late asking from around the room, any questions from anyone from, that's patiently been here with us on this journey? All complaints. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's just happened? So, the bank the bank. Yes, so they sold the money of everyone at that time. So I heard you talking about banking. Yeah. So what is what is the solution? I don't know if there's a solution that it should to go to jail everyone, even <laughs> the government. So what do you think about it? You know, it's, it's <laughs> not, not, not, not enough to be able to speak immediately, <laughs> but I would say it's a really interesting option given the fact the government will be using those banks to finance as well. So yeah, they, give, they give them everything and they still don't want to them. Well, and I think uh, corruption and uh, civ-like uh, financial institutions, we could be here for a whole nother panel. But yes, unfortunately that is one of the challenges is when people do not use resource how it was intended to be used when, when money has been given or money is in a location that then gets moved. We need more international accountability for that. Uh, sorry, that's not an, an, an interesting, but as I've seen it in many different war zones, and the money disappears. It comes in cash and it disappears within hours. Um, so this is also where mindset and humans need to be really strong on who do they find accountable. And unfortunately, fear is a very powerful piece. And when you're dealing with people who move money illegally, often that will involve crime, mafiosa, and etc. And it's really 
you know, we're talking slightly in the microcosm here of people who are trying to do the right thing. And yes, maybe one we haven't been able to explore is how we also navigate the grey space where there are many people that don't want this to succeed. And one of the topics we haven't been able to cover today are the barriers to entry. Because there are many people in transition that unless you reassure them as part of a change management actual activity will fight against what that change may be, including removing finance. Um, so sorry I can't give a more expanded answer, but... Yeah, and when you're wondering why people used to hide the money in a suitcase underneath their bed, now we all know why. Time is good, but I think just, uh, if you'd like to, we, we're here for you. Yes, uh, just uh, one question? Yeah. We waited an hour at the start, so if it takes us a few more minutes now, then... I don't think it's just a question. First, uh, I don't think there will be a light television by 2050, but it's a good What's that? Light yeah, television. Yeah, yeah. Light yeah. television. How about yesterday? Like when we were in 2050, we turned the TV on. Ah, okay, I don't know. But um, uh, when we were back in the days when we were in the forest, the human beings were in the forest, we used to consume like 5,000 calories in a day. Um, nowadays, um, an, an average American um, weighs like. 260,000 calories. Most of those calories come, from, uh, it, it doesn't eat it. it. It's like the fire, the, the use, the car, the, the housing, the transportation. In a day, he uses like 20,600 calories. Um, most of that comes from, from carbon emission companies. So uh, I wonder if there's room for them for diminishing that. But at the same time, we all know that uh, the economy has to grow year by year, and, and that you know, growth comes from more and more consumption. So how do, how do you deal with that dilemma that uh, we need to consume more, but then at the same time, uh, in order for the economy to crash? But from an economic standpoint, I, I, I try that question. And then from, from, I'm from South America. Um, so from a South American standpoint, um, maybe there, there, there's a lot to do with, with, with climate change and uh, the same. Uh, all you people from the north are, are making all this carbon emission, and they say that you take care with the forest of, of all the mess that we are doing. Uh, but when it comes to a farmer in, in the middle of, of Brazil, Get to a point of is, is it profitable for him to, to destroy the, the, the forest and raise, raise cattle, or, or it should be more profitable to, to plant trees or, or do it that way? So uh, it's an economical dilemma in, in that way, also, you know, like in, in countries like Brazil, or I mean, uh, where the forests are. Um. So I might you know, just give two brief anecdotes to help on maybe some, uh, something to help us all explain, explore our own bias. So um, I had some exposure to Coca-Cola uh, when somebody, um, not by drinking it, I, I do occasionally have America's national drink, but not very often, um, when a peer essentially was told, oh, by the way, I've just said that uh, Coca-Cola will be water neutral. And in America, the marketing for Coca-Cola is very different. It used to be you can you go to a restaurant, you have as much as you like. So the value per liter for Coca-Cola value is very different to say, for example, you go to Switzerland, where you might be spending, or Norway, where you might be spending 10 pounds for you know, a can of Coke. So there is also a value system analysis. So our assumption that you need to use more to make more profit I think it's something for us to explore. And that when you're able to actually give credit to someone who uses less, um, so uh, we're working with a team in Ecuador, for example, at the moment, looking at food sovereignty. And the superfoods that are created inside the Amazon would have a huge premium if they had enough to be able to share. But at the moment, the population base barely has enough to feed itself, let alone to then export because it's had palm oil, etc., swapped in. 
So I think this will come back to your financial modeling, is if you can get somebody who is imaginative with the financial modeling, so we've been exploring how you fund the reforestation through charity, because that's a tax deductible, this end. You're helping the food sovereignty at the other end, at the equatorial end, changing using policy, where now you've got European policy that says you cannot have any form of trees coming in that show deforestation. So we're dealing with how do they legally do that. And then you're also exploring palm oil, which many of the charities have been encouraging because it was a cash crop, helping them set up their own strategy for evolution now of what has, in the past, they've said this is a good thing. They now have to persuade the population base, no, we're changing strategy, is many different moving parts. But I think our natural narrative that you need to use more to make more is a key piece we need to address. So one of the areas we always try and encourage everybody is to use less tomorrow than you did today. And if you're using less tomorrow than you did today, eating, I know I need to encourage myself for that. Um, but it's all of these different areas and then work out where's the differential, where are the things you really feel are difficult for you to change and find some quick wins. And then be able to work out what are the complex parts. So just before we finish tonight, where do we stand between us and dinner, one piece, please, from all of the panel that gives you hope that we will be able to hit the net zero targets for our own nations or internationally. One piece of hope from each person. I have no piece of hope. Uh, so I have no hope on that. Okay. Uh, I try to be a bit more realistic. Um, and what I do have hope for is progress towards uh, net zero or ideally uh, other types of zeros like negative ones. Yeah. Uh, what I do see as sources of optimism, which is different than hope, um, um, is related uh, in, in Europe, because this is where I um, have a better understanding, is related to regulation, to uh, what we heard earlier with uh, a new generation of children, which my children are part of as well. Uh, and third, to a change in the way the financial system operates, uh, where we finally have data that shows that yields for sustainable um, the funds are equal and sometimes higher, not marginally higher, but still higher than traditional funding. Uh, and that sh gives trust to the large uh, companies like State Street or the old partners or others to say, we are actually doing this as we said we would, but we're doing it. Uh, so before that, they were just doing it a bit, but now they're pushing. So this is where my optimism comes from. I don't have hope. Optimism is good. Optimism is good. Okay. Okay. I will continue with optimism and hope as well. And the optimism is, uh, you know, survival of the fittest. <laughs> Uh, we have to survive, then uh, we will fit anyway, in a way. But hope is, uh, hopefully, uh, we manage to fit before we need to survive. I'll be even briefer. Uh, <laughs> and I want to build upon what you said earlier. Um, you know, you can't manage what you uh, can't measure. Uh, you have to measure in order to understand. Um, and as the world evolves, you see much more data-driven decisions. Hopefully, the politicians will start to really that as well. Um, with more data, you get deeper understanding, and you start actually doing the smart thing instead of simple politics. Um, that's number one. Number two, uh, we do have some pretty nice data sets uh, in the company. Uh, so what gives me hope is when you see who effectively clicks that button who is interested in addressing their carbon footprint, you know, it's mainly people under the age of 40. Like a huge difference under and over 40. And after all, you know, they are going to be more than more than us uh, in a couple of years. So that gives me hope. Bu anlayış sadece insanlarda değil, bütün kurumlarda geçerli olmalı yalnız. Yani olaya e, kamu kurumlarının, firmaların, çalışanların, yöneticilerin aynı anda bakması önemli. 
Bayramız toplam kalite yönetimi diye bir felsefe var. Japonların ortaya koyduğu bir felsefe. Bu felsefe çerçevesinde olaya bakılmalı. Yani bu, bu felsefe tepeden tırnağa bütün kesimlerin bir olaya odaklanmasıyla ilgili bir felsefe. Yönetim felsefesi malumunuz. Aynı felsefeyi burada da sürdürülebilirlikte de iklim değişikliğinde, iklim finansmanında da uygulayabiliriz diye düşünüyorum. Well, um, Dr. Ibrahim, thank you so much. And I'm sorry that we've, we've kind of you've come with us in the in the second half of this discussion, but it's been fantastic having all your different views. And I'm, thank you for your patience to everyone. So the idea, quality management, understanding at all levels of uh, of the stakeholders, financial modeling. Ali, Luya, to that. Yes, please, more of that, because then it is going to be evidence based which means the investors see the business change. That means that we are seeing what will both work financially and from a business perspective. And um, I guess when uh, what makes me excited is when I do go to places like Bloomberg and hear Unilever swapping, for example, the way in which it grew tomatoes. And in Spain last year, there was a huge issue with water. Unilever was the only one which therefore had no problems with its tomato crop because it had gone back to old school, leaving the foliage, etc. And they've invested a lot into their agriculture. You come back to different countries of the crazy old Coca-Cola working out how it's going to be water neutral because it takes two litres of water to make Coke and only one litre to actually drink it. So I think, like you said, the more we understand the problem, then the more we can deal with it. But I hear a lot of discussion out with this environment about that it all has to be a big business, big policy, national level. Every government is voted in by humans. Every organization is going to be run by humans. And you guys here today are leaders of business in your own right, which demonstrates where there's a hybrid between policy, planning, and personnel, being personal about it. So. Do smart things, not just politics. Great part. I've never been very politically savvy, as you've probably gathered. Um, but in which cases, bring everyone with you. Really love that part too. Understand change management. You know, that's it's not hard if you integrate it from the start. Bring people with you with that vision. Create that vision, and then people know where they're moving forward to. Because if we can't envision it, and we're here as relatively speaking, educated, enthusiastic, driven set of humans, what has the normal person on the street got to look at, apart from doom and gloom and disaster, in which case you'll go home and just think, well, what difference am I going to make? And you continue your life the same. So on a final piece, too, is I think there used to be, and excuse me knowing that we're being recorded, so if I get one of the metrics slightly wrong, I think there used to be 25 net would you say it positive or negative, where you are basically absorbing more carbon than you are emitting? To me, that is positive, but it's positive. It's positive, but it's negative it's emissions. Negative it's emissions, emissions but it's carbon positive. positive. So there used to be around 25 carbon positive nations in the world. We, so the IEN, they have ability to be able to sequester carbon on behalf of us all. Three of those changed last year to now emitting more than they are absorbing because they have taken on our Western fiscal value system and chopped the trees down, changed the way in which they're doing their industry without leapfrogging into the future of technology. And pre this discussion, we also discussed things like telecoms. So in Africa, they did not need to put in the telecom system that we have had because they went straight to mobile. Let's help those who are evolving now who are rebuilding leapfrog. Don't use the same problem set, or don't use the same methodology that has created the problem set we have now. Leapfrog with technology, leapfrog into the future of what is going to be far more sustainable. Because if we are losing nations that are our sequestering sink pots of carbon and other gases, we have nowhere to go. Do you, do you know who, which countries? I can find it. That came from the... Um, Gabon, and because one of the, one of the really great sources of longer term um, strategy is looking at sovereign wealth funds, 
Um, so Gabon is now fighting to get that finance to ensure they can remain as a sequestering country and not be pushed to the other side, and they're really keen on retaining that. Um, but yeah, we can find out the three nations. So, thank you to everyone, and just enjoy today to try and use less tomorrow than we did today.